Oh, God. Uh, I just want to go back to bed. Simple, <laughs> simple stuff. It's insanity. Okay. Go back to bed. All right. Now we drop that down. Now, here comes the sharing part, Rep. This is about as boring as it gets. I know I say this all the time, but Facebook obviously has some of the best programmers on the planet. <laughs> so you would think they could, create a button. they could create one button where you could share everything at one time. We can't do that. No, I mean, it's probably because they want to have access to all those different streams you know, in, in kind of guess. parallel. I'm sure there's some kind of uh, data collection reason behind it. <laughs> well, I don't think they need to record or, or, or I should say save a hundred different recordings of my program, but I'm, they're welcome to do so if they would like. <laughs> I think you can, you know, we all know it's yours. It's proprietary. We get it. Sure. All right, here we go with the Nationals. Oh, this could be a risk. Oh, goodness. Come on, sweetheart. Anytime. 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 There's one. Wow. Could be one of those days. I guess it already is. It's a putting together furniture kind of day. <laughs> We're assembling <laughs> furniture earlier today. <laughs> What else? Could you, what else should you do on Sunday? I was, I was cursing. Well, hopefully, um, it wasn't IKEA. I was cursing IKEA <laughs> for changing the whole IKEA landscape. <laughs> we were just putting together a baker's rack, and still took what two hours? I mean, that was, you know, really. In a great putting... team. It, it could not have been simpler, but it just took, uh, just drug out and took forever. Mm. So I wasn't there, and that's why. If I was there, it would have taken five minutes. But see, that's not fair. You can't take credit like that and then not come here. <laughs> if you want to take the credit, then come here. <laughs> well, it was his birthday, fair. right? Is that correct? <laughs> it was a couple days ago. Yes, by the way, Rep, this is, George is, uh, has be, uh, sorry for him, has been my friend for probably two decades now, <laughs> and uh, is a... a an ace, absolutely outstanding IT individual. Awesome. And when I, and not just the IT, like, you know, build it from scratch kind of guy. And mm -hmm. when I started this program, he said he wanted to, that he was going to volunteer his time and skills as, as technical producer, at least is what I have labeled him. I'm sure he regrets that about every Sunday around five o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> And, and after the new year, possibly every Wednesday from nine o'clock. In addition. Wow, yep, I get an earful from Lynn. She just, you do. Uh, she's yeah. like, are oh, you going to do Wednesday now? Oh my God. Oh. Okay. Well, the beauty of it is if we add a second night, rep, George's salary is going to double uh, <laughs> from zero all the way to zero. Wow. It's going to double. Now, it's now, it's now, a now. huge raise. No, it's going to be zero, zero point zero. Zero is indivisible. <laughs> zero point zero. <laughs> Let's see. Zero times zero. Carry the zero is. Oh, okay. Zero. Mr. Blutarski. Zero <laughs> point <laughs> zero. Eight years of college down the tubes. <laughs> oh, my God. This is. Why is this lagging so badly? Because you didn't get the, you know, because uh, you didn't get the T3 line like I told you to. Hey, I'm paying RCN enough money for <laughs> crap service. <laughs> Jesus. 
We're in the Lehigh Valley. And That's true. You know, yeah. We're still yeah. stringing together tin cans and chicken wire around here for internet service. There's 800,000 people up here. You know? You're paying them enough money. God almighty. Done everything but take my first born if I had one. The, the level of internet I'm getting from them alone was like a hundred and oh boy, it's like a buck and a quarter, I think, just for the internet. Yep, I know what you mean. Come on, come on. I think, I think we're at 50. You're at a hundred, uh, was, was it here at a hundred megabits per second? No, no. I'm at the highest, the highest available residential service. Oh. I'm at the highest. Oh. Highest Ooh. Atlanta, let's turn that down. Okay. Let's turn not that down. Yeah, there you go. That's not what we want to do. Why, why, why are you doing that? Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. No, don't want to do that either. This, this screen is getting really touchy. Has poor iPads on its last legs, I think. This is not a cheap piece of equipment. The poor rep is sitting there thinking, what did I get myself into? This is not what I got elected for. Uh, I've, I've waited on my share of Zoom. Really, so. <laughs> All right, so we're down to groups now. This will go much faster. And then I will start the radio broadcast straight away from there. The show announcement itself. Uh, I think we reached and or broke 100. We usually get actually more shares of the program itself oh. so the show announcement was i, I think we we're right at 100. so we continue to grow we couldn't do it without all of you wonderful folks our wonderful guests of course and george and lynn and Kristen and everybody april um, but of course all of you who sit through these painful technical issues and pre-show uh, frivolity, as it were. So I will, we'll be hearing a theme song very shortly. For anyone who's terribly interested in the pedantic nature of this program, we had to reboot all of our equipment at the last minute because none of us could hear each other. But we're here now. We're okay. Just losing a few minutes. Always darkest before the dawn. And so it is today. Even the computers want to be off for the holidays. Okay. That is all of our sharing. For the five folks that are in the room, thank you. Uh, we are going to be live on the radio in three and two and one. Kennedy, 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 Kenned
You want a man for president who's seasoned through and through. But not so doggone seasoned that he won't try something new. A man who's old enough to know. And young enough to do. Well, it's up to you, it's up to you. It's strictly up to you. But it's Kennedy, 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 Kennedy. Do you want a man with spirit who is not afraid to fight? A man whose record shows that he will fight for what is right. A loyal man who brings the job a fresh new point of view. Well, it's up to you, it's up to you. It's strictly up to you. Cause it's Kennedy, 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 Kennedy. And do you deny to any man the right he's guaranteed to be elected president no matter what his creed? It's promised in the Bill of Rights to which we must be true. So it's up to you, it's up to you. It's strictly up to you. And it's Kennedy, 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 do you like a man who answers straight, a man who's always fair? We'll measure him against the others, and when you compare, you cast your vote for Kennedy, and the change that's overdue. So it's up to you, it's up to you, it's strictly up to you. Yes, it's Kennedy, 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 Kennedy,
Uh, I will see and say hello to you and welcome you to the room. We will see your comments and your questions. You can interact with us and be part of the program. To our sisters and brothers at hot101.net, one of the originators, one of the foundational uh, keystones, so to speak, foundation stones of internet radio. We are proud to be part of the hot101.net family. If you do not know how to listen to hot101.net, it is exceptionally simple. The web address is our name. It's hot101.net. You can find us on the Apple App Store and the Google Google Play Store for Android. And if you have any other type of device, go to the Tune In Radio app and search for Hot101.net. And of course, my favorite new game show that you can play along with at home, you can tell Alexa, hey, Alexa, play Hot101.net. And one of these days, I'm going to trigger one of those Alexas and you're going to tell me that it suddenly switched to us here on the Kennedy Effect. And of course, TCP, the cultural professional from Lancaster. Proud to be part of your family as well. They have their internet, uh, global internet outlet, WTCP, the Roku channel, and of course, a very substantial Facebook uh, presence. They return tomorrow morning live with the morning show uh, from 9 a.m. I have blathered on long enough. We'll be opening up the phone line later in the program. If you miss any of the program and you haven't missed it, we're just late. We just had technical issues. But whenever you miss any of the program, go to the YouTube channel. Uh, that other side of information will find all of our episodes there. Let me get straight to our guest. He's been beyond patient and a man of his word, by the way, because we had the rep scheduled for, oh, goodness, uh, maybe a month-ish ago, something like that, that, somewhere around yeah. that. And it was just a complete scheduling mix-up, a, a, nothing more than a complete unintentional human error. And my goodness, don't we all do that probably every single day. We are human in our fallacies, aren't we? Uh, but he promised he would come back, and now he is here. It is Pennsylvania State Representative Rick Krajewski from the 188th, I remember, thank goodness, Philadelphia County you know. primarily. Uh, so, Rep. Thank you for being a man of your word and for coming back to visit us. And perhaps even more than that, thank you for being so darn patient because that was an absolute blithering <laughs> snowstorm of crap. Well, that would happen just right there. I mean, let's be honest. Yeah, that was yeah. A, um, and I was freaking the hell out. I can tell you that. But uh, as you heard, most of it, um, uh, there, was, there were definitely some words not meant for radio. I don't, <laughs> no question about that. As my all my tech just blew up in my face. But that said, Welcome to the program. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, no problem about the technical difficulties. Uh, at least I'm glad, glad you got it out before you went live. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> we weren't going live without it, that's for sure. <laughs> Let me start the way that I always start. And that is, tell me, tell the folks, who is Rick Krajewski? And how did you get here? Absolutely. Um, so I am a 30-year-old. Uh, multiracial black man state representative for the 188th district, uh, which is in West and Southwest Philadelphia. Um, I've lived there my whole adult life since I was 18 years old. Um, I came to Philadelphia via uh, college. I came here uh, for undergrad at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm originally from the South Bronx in New York City, um, but came here to go to Penn to major in electrical engineering. And uh, what led me to running to a state representative is a lot of my experience around our education system um, and growing up as a uh, black person in a single income working class black family in a lot of these urban Northeast cities in, in Philly and, and also in the Bronx and really being, being aware of the educational privilege I was able to access due to attending a university like Penn. Um, and even before then, my mother had applied me to a scholarship program um, that targeted inner city students of color. Um, but without those opportunities, um, I wouldn't have been able to go on to major in electrical engineering. I would have been able to work as a software engineer for several years, um, which allowed me to pay off my student loans, uh, achieve a, a sense of the kind of middle class lifestyle, and and really, uh, you know, for for lack of a better term, achieve the American dream and pull myself up by my bootstraps in some ways. But many people don't have that opportunity and people shouldn't have to be lucky and they shouldn't have to pull themselves up by, by their bootstraps to achieve, achieve success and achieve educational success. And so in, in wanting to change that system and change that system here in Philadelphia, and particularly in West Philadelphia, where our kids 
are dealing with a drastically underfunded school system that cares more about their zip code or race or class than their actual ability to thrive and, and be in and be in a engaging education system. Um, seeing all that firsthand caused me to become more involved in local politics. And from local politics, I decided to run for state rep in 2020. South Bronx, does that make you a Yankee fan? <laughs> uh, I'm not I'm not too big of a baseball fan, but I have gone to I have gone to Yankee Stadium a few times in my day. I was going to lure you into some trouble there. Was some I know. I saw. I, I, I saw. I saw. I get I saw angry in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know better than talk about baseball in Philadelphia. <laughs> Before I get into some of the deeper policy issues, you, you mentioned your upbringing, where you grew up. You're now in, in Philadelphia, which is obviously, you know, I think Philadelphia remains the seventh largest city in the country. And uh, clearly, by far the largest municipality in 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 Pennsylvania, is it that upbringing that informs your politics, or did your politics exist that way? Do you ever have you sat back from yourself at some point and said, you know, I think I'd believe this. You know, if I was if I was sixty five, white and wealthy, and just sold my own tech company for a few billion, I think I'd still feel this way. Or is it the upbringing, is it, you know, is it, I don't know if that's a nature nurture argument, but is it, mm. is it your upbringing that informs your politics? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and I, I generally think that our politics are defined by our experiences. Um, I think that being someone who grew up in many neighborhoods that have been divested from in the 80s and 90s due to a lot of neoliberal policies and on, on the upswing of mass incarceration, having family members who had been impacted by mass incarceration, um, seeing my mother have to work two or three jobs at a time to be able to provide for our family. And again, being able to, in some ways, escape that and be able to go to a world-class university like Penn, um, while knowing that many of my peers and my neighbors um, were not able to enter a space like that, 100% defined my politics and defined what I thought about education, what I thought about the economy and jobs, what I thought about our criminal justice system. Um, I think while I was experiencing those things, I would not have called them my politics, right? I think they were just experiences for me. Um, I didn't really become political until post-college and um, being a young adult and you know being out out of the educational system and the in institutions that I was growing up in and starting to ask myself like, wait, what was all that crap that I went through? And like, why was it like that? And like, why did it feel so hard? And why did we have to, you know, struggle when I was 10? What was that about? Uh, and, and then I think I developed the language of politics to understand those experiences and, and figure out what systems were responsible for them. So that's a long way of saying, yes, <laughs> um, I do think that experiences define politics. Because when we're young, we don't we don't see that we don't we're just simply not educated enough and mature enough to realize it. We know mom works three jobs, but we may not always know why. And we certainly don't understand if we do understand the why we know it's because that's how we can afford the things we need to exist. But we certainly don't understand the very, very intentional by design uh, f you know going of breaking the 40 year mark effort of this institutional you call it neoliberalism i frankly call it fascism at this point <laughs> it's um, right it's about you know fascism. and in an exceptionally you know because there's nothing genuinely conservative about it there's certainly nothing liberal about it by the way the word liberal is a, you know comes from the greek word meaning freedom um, it, it's an intentional suppression of, we tend to use the word suppression as it's linked to voting, but this is an intentional suppression of 99% of the population. Very, very intentionally. Um, mm -hmm. I had an online discussion with someone earlier in the week about an article I posted about China. We are not, we used to be consumers. 
we were considered consumers by the business world. We're profit centers. Mm -hmm. And the instant that we're not profit centers anymore, we should do what Alan Grayson suggested and die quickly because it's cheaper that way. Is that when you look back on it, is that, do you see the same thing I see? Is it not, am I being too hyperbolic? Is it, do you see what I see? I think, um, no, it's not hyperbolic. I mean, I think, I think that our political system has now matured into fascism, right? Um, I think we saw that really happen. I mean, in strong relief in the last five years, but even before then, right? Um, and to your point about profit, I think what has happened is our society has for, I mean, for the entire history of modern capitalism, decided that profit is prioritized over everything else, right? Over humanity, over our environment, over healthcare, over justice. Um, Everything is beholden to the profits, to the markets, um, to how much money you can make for your shareholders, investors, whatever. And there is a lot of brutalization that happens under that that kind of ideology. Um, so yes, I mean, I think, and, and in particularly in, in, the US, in the United States, right, we have seen a really immoral, like an extremely immoral, extremely brutal um, progression of that mindset. I mean, we start, I think you can trace it back to, you know, Nixon opening China, but it really is the Reagan era that kicked this into gear. We, uh, I say it every week, um, during his presidential campaign, the second one, he didn't say it in the first one, but the second one he did, because remember Reagan ran in 76 as well, challenged a sitting incumbent because he felt he deserved to be president so badly and that we just needed him so badly. Um, why he was running and said openly to destroy everything that is left of the New Deal. Yeah. And isn't that basically the, the country we've grown up in? It's, it's what I find fascinating from maybe a, um, I would choose the right word, almost an anthropological standpoint, certainly a philosophical standpoint, and I guess a political science standpoint, you don't know a nation without Reagan. And yet you have arrived at these progressive New Deal, square deal, Great society, moonshot, liberal points of view. I find that fascinating. Why do you think more folks have not made that connection? Um, Because they don't know, right? Um, Because the vast majority of the public isn't politicized. I mean, speaking for myself, like I still consider myself to be a newcomer to politics, right? I had all these experiences but I didn't have any language to articulate who was responsible um, in government, who was responsible, what was responsible in regards to socioeconomic systems. And it wasn't until um, I really started to investigate that and, 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 be, and be challenged in investigating that in a very extreme way over the past five years, right? I mean, I'll say the one of the big turning points for me in becoming even more political was, um, Two, uh, two things on the presidential level, right? One, seeing Bernie Sanders run his 2016 campaign and, and see someone who was speaking to something that I believed and felt, but didn't see reflected in a politician with that high of a profile. Um, and so seeing that and being agitated by that and then being infuriated by Donald Trump's campaign, right? And having someone who was openly fascist and nationalistic and sexist and racist and um really an ideologue of the worst and yet yet in 16 he ran on so much of bernie's platforms Mm -hmm. we have to stop these trade deals we need to bring jobs home Mm -hmm. the minimum wage is too low corp the rich need to be taxed he ran on bernie's platform 
Well, yeah, he ran yeah. on a right wing populist agenda, right? He ran on a populist agenda that was just a smokescreen for just wanting to have Take power over. and dereg and just you know destroy everything, <laughs> right? He, he was a Trojan horse populism, basically. Uh, and so seeing that happen, seeing that person win, and truly thinking we were going to have some kind of like race war <laughs> as a black person, right? Um, all that led to me being very scared and very angry. And uh, I, the, the story I like to say, and it's, it's a pretty funny one, is there was another friend of mine at the time who I would talk to about like political stuff, just just like not even, you know, if any kind of theory or strategy or anything, just someone to talk about. But she, and she was also black and talking about just like how much things started to feel really shitty um, and just really suck. And I remember um, shortly after the general election, um, she had sent me a screenshot to a open emergency meeting for a group called Reclaim Philadelphia, which I'd never heard of before. And so I was like, all right, bet, let's go. Like, I'm angry. I need to direct his anger to somewhere. And um, this looks like a place that I'm intrigued by, intrigued by and interested in. And so I went to this meeting, um, ended up going by myself because she ended up not being able to attend. And that meeting was the spark that I needed to then become very politicized, very organized, become a super volunteer, get involved in local politics and local campaigns, and then have the experiences and thoughts and vision to decide to run for state rep. Um, had any of those things in that path not happened, I wouldn't be here, right? And I'm very fortunate to have had all those things kind of come together in a call it fate, call it whatever. Um, but for a lot of people, um, they don't have that opportunity to be politicized. Um, they may be too suppressed under the current system to even have the capacity to become politicized, right? Um, and our social political system doesn't want them to be politicized, <laughs> you know, like, um, the other reason it doesn't happen is because there's been no initiatives to make it happen from our system at large, right? Um, turnout is consistently under 50%. That's that people seem to be fine with that, <laughs> right? Like, you know, there's no, there's no real accountability around, um, how the day-to-day -day of, of our current society causes people to be brutalized and devastated so under that system how could you expect most people to be politicized you know and turnout in philadelphia um i'm really trying to pull this number out of my head thankfully kristen's listening um in in the odd year election mm -hmm. in the in the in the off year I, well, I don't say off year we don't use off year we use odd year because it's a number mm -hmm. it's a year that ends in an odd number there are no off years uh, voter participation in Philadelphia in the in the 21 election cycle, I think, was only 18 percent. Well, I was going to say 19. Yeah, it was like 18 or 19. Like it was all, I mean, less, less than one in five. <laughs> right. And you also have the the added joy of all of the uh, of all the different things that sparked you politically. You also have. What really was nothing short of the Trump regime essentially declared war on Philadelphia. I mean, there were there were there were certain targets, racially motivated targets. Let's be honest, mm -hmm. and scapegoat targets. I think San Francisco was one, but Philadelphia was a big, was just a big old dog that just took kicks to the teeth because he could. Well, here's the thing I'll say on that: is uh, Philadelphia loved it. <laughs> just just so you know. Um, because Philly people like a fight, <laughs> right? We like, we like, and we like, um, I think, the, I don't think he understood what he was getting himself into in, in saying, in saying those comments and, and targeting in Philadelphia. Cause I can tell you here when that happened, um, we, we really clowned him. Um, and like, we took that if anything as incentives to become even more mobilized and that same year uh during the general election 
when it was coming down to the wire and they were counting ballots in the convention center, we organized a massive resistance party that showed up and made sure that the ballots were gonna be counted, that we weren't gonna have any crazy Trumpers interrupting it, trying to disrupt things. And part of why that energy came out so strong was because Trump tried to call us out. <laughs> and so we were like, oh, you want bad things happen in Philadelphia? We'll show you what bad things happen in Philadelphia, right? Um, and so that to me actually stands out as a moment, not of like, fear or or offense or anything to me that actually I, I i enjoyed that moment a lot in time because what i saw happen was we were attempted to be called out and we used that as an opportunity to actually mobilize and, and stand up for ourselves it was galvanizing to an extent yes, yes absolutely we tried to make a scapegoat out of you uh uh you know a, a shadow in the you know a shadow that's lurking around the corner try to make you the point of everything to be afraid of. Uh, you know, we remember the comments during the campaign of that, you know, hey, people in the suburbs, they're trying to move out. They, they mm -hmm. are trying to move out by you mm -hmm. and take everything you have. Mm -hmm. When it was really the Trump regime that was trying to take everything you have from you, increasing taxes on the bottom nine, 99% while cutting $8 trillion of taxes on corporations and the top 1%. Yep. Yeah, no, I mean, and I think that a lot of people just saw through that, you know, and, and really didn't take it like, um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's a moment that I'll always <laughs> remember as a, as a moment in like, honestly, like Philly pride. I think a lot of people felt proud of how we stood up when he, when he tried to do something like that. Now you took the path of not, of not being involved let me back up and ask it this way. One of the many, many, ha we all wear so many hats in mm -hmm. a modern society, especially it's not, you know, sadly, it's not the fifties anymore, at least to the point where one breadwinner in a house could take care of everything. Mm -hmm. We all have several different hats. We have, uh, you know, some of us have multiple jobs or it's, you know, work and activism and advocacy and, 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 um, among one of my hats is with our revolution, Pennsylvania, we have dedicated ourselves, absolutely dedicated ourselves, our only mission now, up until the primary, the Pennsylvania primary date is going to be to get folks elected to every level of the Democratic Party hmm. and restore it to its original roots, away from the corporate, from the big bank money, insurance money, cozying up to all the wrong folks that we don't need. And it's why sometimes that we can't get things done, uh, not because we hate our party, but specifically because we love it. And because it is the only functioning political party in the country, um, because the Republicans don't, they're not a political party anymore, they're a corporation. Mm. You made a step running directly into office without intra-party uh, deep activism inside the party is that was that a plan did that come from mm. just circumstance um do you believe in the democratic party in pennsylvania some actually say there's three parties in harrisburg the republicans the democrats who are happy to be there and the ones who actually want to do something <laughs> i mean tell us sure. tell yeah, us yeah, about yeah. your path to office and your relationship as you see it with the Democratic Party at whole? Yeah, so to me, um, I feel very aligned to what you laid out about um, the desire to, to push and move the Democratic Party to one that's actually a party for people and a party for restoring the social fabric, the social safety net, and, and really just showing what it means for government to care about its people and to actually safeguard and, and provide guaranteed safety for his people. Um, and currently as a state representative who is part of the left wing of my party in, in Harrisburg, I see that as my objective, right? To use my values, my stance, my following, my, my beliefs to show 
that there is a path in being a Democrat, but also being strong, a strong progressive voice and to show that that's viable and that that is something that people resonate with and believe in and to use that to move my colleagues. Um, so one of the things that I've already seen a lot of progress on in my time, um, and this is a little bit, you know, in, Har in Harrisburg, you take the wins you can get. Um, so one of the things we've already seen this year is an increased ability to whip other members to vote against bad legislation. Um, and one of the things I'll particularly pull out is, is, a third, is a lot of the criminal justice bills that we see in the legislature. Um, these people want to lock everyone up, <laughs> like truly everyone up. And it's profitable. It's profitable. It's a way to ensure that people that don't agree with them, it, I mean, it's fascist. Right. You know, if you if, right, certain, if you're, you you can't vote when you're in prison. No. And if there's a certain marginalized community that you don't want or you don't want to see thrive, you, you come up with some crazy thing to try to lock them up. And so um, and it's fear mongering also. Right. Because we know fear is a way to retain power. So I'm sure you're familiar with it was Nixon's chief of staff. Haldeman, who the said, one, oh, yes, about the, the way said, you like code. We can't we can't lock up kids for being in college. Right. We can't lock them up for protesting the war. We can't lock them up for being poor. We can't lock them up for being black, but we can lock them up for drugs. Right. So we will. Right. And kind so, of created the private prison industry going all the way back to the mid seventies. Yeah, no, we have. And it's, it's, it's been around for a long time. And so you just see this happen again and again and again during session weeks where these crazy bills come up for floor votes. And I think historically, a lot of people would just either not really be paying attention or some people agreed with these bills uh, or some were like, you know what, it's not worth pushing, pushing back against because the governor's going to veto it or my district is, you know, whatever. It's a 60-40 split and I might get a negative mailer saying that, you know, representative so-and-so supports pedophiles because they voted against this bill, right? And it's like the kind of spin they use around crazy things. Um, but we've actually been able to organize members to speak out and really speak to why these bills are awful, um, how they will cause untold collateral damage to people that are swept up under these ridiculous expanding of crime codes. And we've seen members be moved by that and be convinced and, and vote no on a bill that maybe in a prior session they would have voted yes for. And to me, that's the work of moving the party more towards the vision that we believe in, right? Well, two things, really. Have you found that group of members of our own party, or at least that wear the label, is that group growing? That group, and when you say that group, you mean like our kind of, the, like, which, which group? The folks that... The, uh, again, the, it, it's a relatively commonly held fact that there are three parties in Harrisburg. All the Republicans, because they Republicans vote in lockstep. Republicans fall in line, Democrats fall in love. <laughs> then there are, you refer to it as a left wing. Mm. I simply see it as the roots of the party. Mm. Our history. Mm. It's, it's the corporate Democrats that are the aberration. They're the they're the the wrong ninety degree turn. Mm. The things that you and I believe in: the New Deal, a progressive tax system, mm -hmm. the moonshot, the Great Society, the fact that people, if they're breathing and they're legal, should be able to vote. Right. Simple, th simple, simple stuff like that. It's not that's not even progressive. It's simply history. So when you talk about that group of Democrats in the middle who are, who are I occasionally refer to them as the beauty queens, they have a tiara, a, bu a bouquet of flowers, a sash, and they're just damn happy to be there. And they don't do a hell of a lot because it's easier to get reelected when you don't piss anybody off. It's true. Is the group, is that group shrinking and moving more to work with you and help with you? Are they feeling more? Maybe they were always progressive down here inside, but because they were so overwhelmed by the right, it was easier just to sit there and not say anything. Hmm. Are, what, what is the 
what does the tide, so to speak, of the boat yeah. and the ship well, that is the Democrats in, in Harrisburg? What is the what's the right, tide? Right. You well, know, well the thing you're, you're trying to see, Jeff, is um, one, there are many newer members. So um, my class had I'm trying to remember exactly how many but we had at least a dozen new members the previous class had about 20 25 something like that so you're seeing just a lot of newer representatives in the legislature right now and with a newer art this newer generation of reps um these are people that are running because they are tired of the status quo right and they're tired of seeing a politics that isn't inspiring that isn't engaging that isn't agitating and I think that we have seen that reflected in the Democratic caucus because those younger members are saying like, we're not taking this shit on the chin anymore, right? Like we actually have to move and be bold and do different um, because a lot of these people, I mean, even for me, like I had a life before being a state rep, like I, I ran because I feel like my future is on the line. Um, I'm in a school district that I can't say with certainty would provide my child with an adequate education. I live in a neighborhood that has a housing market that is extremely developer and corporate beholden, um, which means that I don't know if I'll be able to afford a home and I make good money. <laughs> and then I don't know if I'll be able to afford to uh, actually purchase a home in my own community. And many people ran because of that, because their own future was on the line. And when your future is on the line, when you're clear about your stake, you're not just trying to go in and clock it in, clock in a day and then leave it to a clock. You're, you're actually trying to get things done. And so I think that we've seen a big class of those kind of people enter the legislature. And, it ha and that has had an effect on emboldening both those members, but also other members, too, who maybe, yeah, were asleep at the wheel for a little too long. But then someone gave them a sharp elbow in the ribs, and now they're, you know, now they're a little more at attention. They're a little more awake. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And that's, you know, I don't, I, I promise I will not get off on a tangent. I'm really good at that, getting off on tangents. But you did say something interesting about rent and purchasing. Remember when it used to be a goal in this country to be a homeowner? Yeah. And we have very and very intentionally, uh, again. And, it's still, and it, it still is a goal for a lot of people, you know? It still is a goal. It, it used to be a goal the government helped with. Yes. It used to be a goal. It used to be a societal goal. It used to be an economic goal. There was a time where business owners, both small and the absolute largest, knew that homeownership was a good thing for the country. I now tend to think that these, because we have them here in Bethlehem as well. These, mm -hmm. And Allentown is actually in the middle of constructing a massive, massive, massive uh you know quote unquote redevelopment project but we all know that they're all going to be rentals you're not gonna be able to buy a damn thing in there and we've trapped an entire generation of people into a cycle of rent yep. because they can get out of their parents or they have to have somewhere to you know they they can find a spot to live when the new job comes up maybe they you know maybe they were born and raised in the south bronx and got a good job in philadelphia and so they rent because they're not established there the way a bank would want to see to grant a mortgage. But that rent is just high enough compared mm -hmm. to the overall salary that you can't sock anything away and ever buy anything again. Right. It, 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 that's not, you know, when we talk about the intentional destruction of the middle class, and for the first time in our history, folks, since the New Deal itself, since the Republican Great Depression of the late 20s and 30s and the Democratic New Deal solutions, for the first time, less than 50% of Americans self-identify, even if they're wrong, mm -hmm. even if by the numbers and the statistics they are wrong, mm -hmm. less than 50% self-identify as middle class. Yep. Because we've taken it on the teeth. We've had everything extracted from, damn near everything extracted from us. Yeah. But we, I ask, I, that might be an uncomfortable question, but I ask about your colleagues because we've got a group of them in the Valley. Mm. You really don't hear a hell of a lot from, except around re-election time. Yeah. <laughs> They're just kind of happy to be there. Right. And if I don't call out my Republican colleagues, 
you know, colleagues, if you can even extend, it's almost a collegial term, and I'm not even sure you can extend that term anymore. If yeah. I don't piss them off, that means I don't piss off the Republican voters that are in my district, and then I can just cruise to another re-election. But mm-hmm. what about the actual legislating? Mm-hmm. Is that, are you, do, are, do you find yourself with more partners there? I do. Honestly, I find myself with more than I was expecting. Um, I thought that I was going to show up and people are like, oh, I'm not working with that guy. He's a crazy, crazy radical socialist. I can't talk to him. Um, but people do respect when you come with a clear vision. And if you're able to speak um, about collaborating in a way that that speaks to their interests, right? Um, when I talk to people about working together and working on legislation, working on agenda, whatever, I'm not saying like, hey, I want to work on this together because I want to push socialism, <laughs> right? Um, I'm, I'm talking to them because, uh, and I'm talking with them in a language that's saying, hey, I want to work on this bill because I think that everyday people deserve half a livable wage um, because I believe that environment, the environment is a human right. I believe that healthcare is a human right. I believe that education is something that we should be giving our kids, not as a privilege, but just as a guarantee. And when you come with language first and when you come with an understanding of where someone is at when it comes to those values, um, they don't really care too much about the other stuff, actually. Um, at least the people that really want to get things done, right? Um, they just want to see if you're coming to them in a collaborative way to work on things that are going to further both of your interests. So I found a lot of partners in, in that regard. Let me ask you about that crazy, radical <laughs> socialist. I, 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 Kristen and I joke all the time about how those kind of things have become uh, spaghetti against the wall. Mm. When you hear, mm-hmm. especially when you hear, you know, uh, especially an extreme right winger labeling, screaming at somebody from, and more so really even the self-identified right winger, quote unquote, man on the street who will just, you, you communist socialist, corporatist fascist pig i'm like wait hang on you realize you just went from one to a hundred <laughs> you understand that too you know, just mad at you, you know, a bunch of the terms you just use there are absolutely antithetical to each other do you get that are you that are you that indoctrinated or is it a lack of education whatever but isn't it a bit sad and maybe i'm answering my own question and please feel free to disagree that you have to wear that tag so to speak, when even sometimes with folks that are in our own party or folks that that keep the D behind their name, Mm -hmm. this isn't radical. What the hell is radical about the New Deal? What was radical about Jefferson and Madison themselves, two of the framers Mm -hmm. of this nation and its constitution and its declaration of independence for that matter, themselves saying no we have to have a progressive tax system people who make the most money should pay the most most money or jefferson jefferson didn't start the university of virginia for profit i mean isn't it sad that we sometimes have to make the case that we're not the radical ones yeah we're the we're the we're the history of our own party we're the basis of our own party we're the reason why there is a party. Yeah. See, now the thing is for us, these these values are not radical, right? They're 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 natural. They're actually um she just remember uh so uh, Nikhil Saval, who's now one of my colleagues who also ran for state senate at the same time, I was just reminded of a TV ad that he did where uh his bit line was it's not radical, it's rational. <laughs> um and we know it's, that it's, it's even more than that, though. It's history. We've done this before. Right. And we We've know done that, this right? before. We right. haven't been able to establish that National Health Service the way they have in the UK. I get that part. But government paying for things like schools, building post offices, airports, water systems, electrical systems, uh, the government doing 
uh, you know, wink, 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 radical things like making sure your food doesn't kill you. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, these are all part of the commons. Not the government paying for those horribly, horribly socialist libraries and things like that. We, we, we've done this before. This isn't new. We've done this before. We haven't done it for 50 years. So you think it's new, but we've mm -hmm. done this before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have, and a lot of people don't know that. And it's the other thing, right? Is a lot of people, I mean, the people who have these notions of like some radical Antifa radicals taking over and overthrowing everything are being fed a corporate media narrative oftentimes in a media desert. I mean, you, you, a lot of these rural places don't have local news sources. They don't have any kind of local political infrastructure that is speaking to everyday issues. Instead, what they're seeing is they're on Facebook or they're online or whatever, or they got their TV on and they're listening to sensationalized Fox News, right? Which wants them to believe all of that crap, right? Because then it allows them to stay hooked to have to, to, to agree with their agenda, um, to, to be misled about what good government is, right? Um, and that's what, their ideology. Or what government is at all. Yeah. The role of and, government and, is about anything. Right. And that's the thing is a lot of these people, and you know, even speaking to Republicans, like they they think good government is no government, right? Um, they believe that government should be doing nothing and that it should all be left to private forces. And these people do that because of who they're beholden to, right? They're beholden to corporate interests, the media. Um, they're beholden to a right-wing populist agenda that cares more about power than the, than the well-being of their own, their own constituents, right? And that's, and that's the other thing that's crazy about this is the, some of the people who are most strongly vocally against the things that we're for are some of the people who would actually benefit the most. Um, and so an example I'll, I'll share to land that point is one of the things that we fight for in regards to education funding is uh, putting funding through the fair funding formula. So, you know, in 2015, right, it was, it was legally determined that the state of Pennsylvania has been criminally <laughs> underfunding, criminally underfunding its school systems throughout the state. And so this fair funding formula was created and we have started putting money through the fair funding formula, but only new funding. So only every, any new money since 2015, which is about 10%. So 90% of our basic education money is still not being appropriately distributed throughout the Commonwealth. And Republicans have been vehemently against it, right? Vehemently against putting it into the funding formula um, because they don't think the government should be affecting it, right? They don't think we should be in, in meddling of education, period. And the ironic thing about it, though, is the district that would benefit the most from putting all of the, our education funding to the fair funding formula is Stan Saylor, who is the chair of the Appropriations Committee of the Republican Party in the House. So the person who's literally responsible for pulling the purse strings when it comes to our budget and, and funding priorities would benefit the most from a thing that he is strongly against. Well, when you talk about, well, let me, let me do my business part here. It's 6.03 Eastern time. Uh, my first reset of the program since we started so late because we love tech. Uh, the very same tech that allows me to be with you is the very same tech that took a crap earlier in the hour. And we had a reboot and reset everything. So we did get started late. I have not reset the program. Let me do my job here for a sec. Wherever you are watching. Well, first off, you're watching and listening to the Kennedy Effect. We are live at 604 eastern time here in the commonwealth of pennsylvania for the 12th of december the remainder of this program and only one more live program left in 2021 wherever you are watching and or listening across the facebook universe thank you very much for being there we've shared the program to about a hundred different places this week and that continues to rise ever so slightly uh as i reminded you last week 
with our guest, Kevin Scogland. Kevin, I think, was our third, second or third guest that we had the program. Uh, at that point, we had no radio outlets, and I believe we shared the program to about a dozen places. We are now at two global radio outlets, a television outlet, and about 100 Facebook Place, uh, places across Facebook. So the program continues to grow and we could not do any of it without you. Each and every single individual out there that listens to the program, be it live or on the recording, we could not be here if you are not there. Wherever you are listening across the Facebook universe, Thank you for being there. You can stay right where you're watching if you are at the New Deal Democrats, the Progressive Party, Progressive Pints. I love the Progressive Pints because this Irish guy likes a pint every now and then, a little more than every now and then. don't have one all that often, but I really fancy one an awful lot. The, uh, the Mac Pack, the Lehigh Valley Young Democrats, the Lehigh Valley Progressive Network, uh, the uh, Pennsylvania Democratic Politics, any one of the in almost a hundred places where we share this program stay right there enjoy we are just happy that you are here however if you would like to join the conversation we invite you and ask you to come over to our home group facebook page that other side of information that other side of information you will see the program right in the timeline like a regular you know posting Tap on it, it will expand. You will see the comment section and that's where we want to hear from you. Ask a question, agree, disagree, yell, kick, scream, whatever you wanna do, do it in there in the comments. If I see your comment, I will read it. If I see your question, I will read it. To our sisters and brothers, friends and family at hot101.net, one of the originators of global internet radio, we are proud to be part of the hot101.net family. It means very, very much to us for you to welcome us into your uh, your desktops, your laptops, your phones, your tablets, your Bluetooth speakers, uh, if you're listening in the car, and now, of course, your Alexa devices. We very much thank you for welcoming us onto your into your families, into your Sunday evenings, all around the globe at hot101.net. To be honest, it might not be Sunday where some of you are listening, come to think of it. We are in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, dotted throughout the African continent and the Western European continent, and of course, listeners in South America, Central America, and in Canada and across the United States. We thank you for being there. If you do not know how to listen to hot101.net, the web address is our name. It's hot101.net, the Apple App Store, the Google Play Store for Android, and the Tune in radio app and you can ask Alexa to play hot101.net and TCP the culture professional television network out of Lancaster home grown, by the way, right out of Lancaster. We thank them for being part of our program for carrying our program. And we carry the morning show at that other side of information every morning, and they will be back with you live tomorrow morning. So thank you for that. I'll put the phone number up very shortly as well. You can call me, talk to the rep, talk to me, yell, scream. Well, don't yell, scream. Nah. Keep the yelling and screaming on the text part, I guess, unless you got a good point to make. But we'll take your phone calls. I'll put the phone number up very shortly. What is a day like for you in Harrisburg? We have a, a you know, the party opposite was willing to hide when their members had COVID. And if you caught it and it killed any of you, they seem to be perfectly okay with that. They've declared war on your city. Uh, at the same time, trying to use Philadelphia as a scapegoat for everything, they also try to treat Philadelphia as if it's somehow not part of Pennsylvania. They have done a masterful job of convincing the rural parts of our state that their policies are good for them when in fact it's their policies that have landed the rural parts of the state exactly where they are now. Uh, I am not five minutes from the Bethlehem steel plant, mm. which is now a tourist attraction. Mm -hmm. Yep. Selling mm. goods, selling goods and souvenirs with the Bethlehem steel logo made in China. An irony that is never lost on me every time I look at one and I, th and we go and I think to myself, that's a cool looking shirt or that's a cool thing. And that's a cool thing. You pick it up and it's made in China. The irony of having something with the Bethlehem steel logo on it made in China is absolutely inescapable. It, you drown in irony. 
Mr. Reagan told the people of Lehigh Valley that that steel plant would keep them and their families in the middle class or better for the next century. He lied. He lied intentionally. He lied on purpose. I don't even know how, I don't even know sometimes how good folks like you, uh, Rep. Joe has been on with us. I'm waiting to get Senator Saval and Senator Ra and, uh, and Rep. Rab, by the way, uh, who both said they'll come visit as soon as I can make it, we can get a time. Oh. Rep. Kenyatta, I've talked to him too. How do you even get Sorry. through the day? Like, what do you do? Like, when you walk in in the morning and maybe you go to your office, do you just sit, take a really deep breath and go, okay, here we go again? Or is it, are you friends with some of them? Is there, like, when you go to the Capitol gym or Capitol cafeteria, cafeteria, or maybe when you walk out into Harrisburg itself, do some of the Republican reps look at you and go, look, we know it's all crap. We just got to do what we got to do because it makes us money. We get rich yeah. off of it and it keeps us in office. What, what, what can you tell us about your day or a typical day, if there is a typical day, and your interactions with, with the other side of the aisle? Yeah, um, you know, it's with the other side of the aisle, it's pretty difficult um, just because it can be hard to, it can be hard to empathize with people that legislate and vote on things that feel like uh, really deny your existence um, and deny the existence of communities you care about. Um, I can remember pretty vividly uh, when we were uh, voting on, uh, there was a anti-abortion bill by uh, Francis Ryan, uh, a fetal remains bill, which basically would have made it uh, you, you would have been, you, you would have had to have provided a death certificate for uh, fetal remains. <laughs> um, you know, not, not even necessarily like an actual, you know, pregnancy, just, just fetal remains. Um, just crazy stuff, truly like awful, immoral stuff. And uh, I remember the vote happened and I think pretty much all of the Republicans voted for that bill. Maybe, maybe one person maybe voted against, but pretty much unanimous. And I remember going to like the break room in the back afterwards and another Republican member coming in the back too and like trying to make small talk with me while we were there. And I was just like, don't talk to me. <laughs> like you just voted on an insane bill that will extremely restrict the rights of of people to control their bodies and you're talking to me like it was nothing at the know? same time screaming you know my my body my choice when it comes to getting a vaccination but not if you're female and pregnant right right Right. I mean, because God knows those two things completely square each it's other. It's just naked hypocrisy. Um, right. And so that's a hard, those, those, those are, those are pretty hard mental gymnastics to do, Jeff, to, <laughs> to see someone vote for bills like that and to then act so nonchalant about it. Um, so I'm going to be honest, I don't, I, I haven't figured that out yet. Um, and it's something that, I need to do because we I, I, we have to be able to move some Republican members to move things in the interim, right? While we're in the, we are in the minority party and we can do things to push and agitate and, and create a bigger presence. But tr truthfully, the Republicans hold a lot of keys to things. So it's, 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 it's a tough situation. Has anybody ever you know, when someone's trying to make that small talk, is it the same kind of small talk we make just on a day to day basis? If I'm waiting in the grocery line and they make small yeah. talk with the person in front yeah, of me, he's talking, he's talking about peanut butter crackers, or is it, <laughs> or is there, is there the occasional, I know I just asked this, but is there the occasional moment of honesty, the occasional moment of clarity where someone looks at you, like you can look at that Republican rep and say, what did you just do? 
and they actually look back at you and go, look, we don't believe a damn word of it. We just, just what we have to do. Like, I don't, I actually think there's a, a, a measurable, I, maybe I shouldn't say significant, a measurable number of Republicans who don't believe a bloody thing that they support. I don't think they believe a damn word of it, but they're mm-hmm. getting, but they're, they want a job when they're done. They're getting wealthy from it. Mm-hmm. And they love power. When you mentioned earlier, you used the phrase that they don't believe in government. Bullshit that they don't. Of course they do. Because how do you extract wealth from the rest of us and hand it to the top without the power of government? They certainly mm-hmm. don't mind government spending when we hand, give away, free. And I don't need to tell you this. You're there. We hand away $3.2 billion a year to the fossil fuel industry. They don't mind government spending then. I mean, do they believe this crap? Are, I know there's some diehards, let's be blunt. There's all, There always are. Sure. Or are the most of them just like, eh, you know, paid for this suit, paid for that car, paid for this thing about it was, Yeah. No, I, I think that they prioritize their material well-being over their beliefs. And they do that because they, they, they see that this narrative right or wrong resonates with people and so they have decided you know in order for me to stay in power i'm going to push this rhetoric that i know is hateful and i know is divisive and inflammatory but i also know it works and you know i care about yeah my own well-being over the harm that it causes and i think a lot of them that I think that is the story for a lot of them. Um, have any of them, you know, admitted that behind closed doors? N- no, not to me, maybe to others. Um, I will say I had a moment a few weeks ago during, I'm a, I serve on the health committee and there is this bill being pushed by uh, Paul Schemmel called the Vaccine uh, Options Act or something like that. And what the bill does is it it lays out certain stipulations that would allow someone to opt out of a, a vaccination mandate. And well, none of them make sense, right? But the most egregious stipulation was a negative COVID test. And, and when I say that, I mean a negative COVID test at any point in time. And so I asked him, can you explain the scientific rationale around why you can be exempt from a vaccination requirement if you get a negative COVID test at any time? <laughs> um, like, and he said, he said, he said to me, it was political. He actually, he actually admitted that in front of the committee that it was a political decision that he didn't even agree with. Um, but I had to like pin them to be able to even get that out of them, right? So, so, your, so all that, to your point, yes, I think a lot of them truly don't actually believe what they're pushing, but they saw, they see that people are hooked on it and it works. Did that particular piece of legislation eliminate vaccines for children entering school? Um, it or was, those, those are okay, just the, just the COVID one is really good for politics. So that's the <laughs> one that we focus on. That's the one we focus on. Right. I mean, they, they're, they're focused on the on the hot new thing. It's, it's COVID vaccines and critical race theory and whatever. But not else. the not the measles, mumps and rubella uh, no. vaccine that you need to go to attend public school. Right. Yeah. No, I know. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I, one of my another hat I wear is I work with candidates and I try to make candidates better candidates. Um, and one of my favorite phrases is that hypocrisy is always a winner. Mm hmm. But it doesn't seem to be the winner it used to be. Yeah. Am I right or wrong? That is hypocrisy being the winner it used to be. Yeah. It doesn't seem to be the drop dead winner that it always used to be. When you could, when you could stand on a stage with your opponent and show the hypocrisy, you voted, you know, you voted for choice with this vaccine, with this COVID vaccine, but you want to condemn women to carry a pregnancy because it's your body and your choice. Why don't they get a choice? And by the way, a vasectomy is a lot cheaper, quicker, and less painful. 
and by the way, the woman didn't get, you know, there's only been one immaculate conception that I recall in history. <laughs> so, you know, you're doing this. How about that kind of hypocrisy? How about that you can't spend money for schools or roads or environmental cleanup, but we can hand 3.2 billion to the fossil fuel industry because, oh, by the way, they gave you 10 grand for your, for your campaign. And usually you could say that on a stage, especially when that person's standing to your right. Um, and people in the audience, even if they are traditional supporters of that person standing to your right, would get it. But it seems to me that that's faded. Mm -hmm. Do you happen to agree with that? Yeah, well, I think that I think that a lot of them don't care or will find some way to spin their hypocrisy as actually a, a straight line <laughs> in, in their values, right? Because they'll say, well, they'll say to that, right? Uh, the thing about a, a, a woman's ability to choose, what they'll say to that is, well, what about the choice of the baby, right? Like what about the, uh, you know, what about the choice of the unborn baby? Do they get a choice, right? Um, and so what they'll do is they'll spin their rhetoric around, right, the, their ideology to make it seem like it's not a hypocrisy. And I think that plus is not caring, right? I think that they just don't, they don't care that they're hypocritical because a lot of times their constituents don't care because a lot of times these people have been fed a hypocritical message and haven't been shown any other message to counteract that one right um so i think there's just a there's just a a pretty a pretty naked apathy about being hypocritical <laughs> what has emboldened that do you believe is it the is it the overwhelming corporate money that are flowing to some of these folks is it fox news and the right-wing hate media machine is it gerrymandering is it all of the above where a man where a guy like doug masterano can storm the capitol and participate actively participate in an insurrection to end end the american experiment and that's not hyperbole by the way i won't even accept that it might be to end the american experiment end the rule of law given us through a mutually agreed upon constitution and can still yeah. get reelected as some sort of i generally refer to him as would be comic republican comic book superhero doug masterano and be hailed somehow as some kind of hero when he's willing to end this the type of nation that we are what emboldens that is it that lack of education that you talked about or lack of understanding is it the right-wing hate meeting machine is it gerrymandering what what emboldens this uh what emboldens it is it's been sensationalized right a lot of these people have just like hacked into the fears of the fears and anxieties of everyone, right? Everyone under modern capitalism, right? The thing, and, that, and that's part of the thing that we have to understand, right? And when you talk about going back to the roots of the party, right? If you go to the roots of people and their suffering, the people that are in a lot of these rural, exurban, suburban places are dealing with the same issues that we are in cities like philadelphia they're worried about if they're going to be able to cover their payments whether it's rent or mortgage they're worried about their health care their rising prescription drug costs they're worried about their environment right you have a lot of rural places that are that they're these uh, a lot of these rural places are having their land gobbled up by fracking sites right air compressor sites drilling sites pipelines um, you have people who are also dealing with not having adequate school infrastructure in their communities. So they're scared and they're anxious and they're not and, and they're uncertain about their future. And these people, um, the, the representatives, the local electeds, Fox, Trump, whoever, 
have hijacked that fear, have manipulated it, and packaged it into a, a messaging platform that these people think speak to their interests, but actually speak to the interests of corporations, profit, right? Maintaining social order. And that is to me really the 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 thing to hold to account and and to really and to really hold accountable and remember is that these people who are coming out with such fear, vitriol, hate are responding to their own fears and anxieties about their daily existence, right? And we should, and we, and, it, and that's nothing to disregard. At the fear of looking like I'm asking you the same question over and over and over again, let me try it again. If I am, I, I actually kind of don't mean to be. I feel like I'm on a different thought, but maybe mm. as I play the question ahead of time in my head, it might sound like the same question over and over again. I agree with you, of course. I remember sitting here anchoring an online vigil that we did for George Floyd mm. and talking to Representative Jamie Raskin, talking to Senator Dick Durbin, talking to, I think I spoke to Senator Haywood that day. Oh, wow. Um, and asking, uh, I also spoke to, a, to a, a, I think she was from Houston, if I'm not mistaken, a black female sheriff, you know, and saying, awesome. and I asked a question that really made everybody kind of give me a dirty look and said, what the hell do you, what do you want? What do you people want? Hmm. And at the second that I could see everybody kind of stiffen their spine, I said, I'm going to tell you what you want. You want the same damn thing the rest of us do. I don't think black folk or gay folk or or Asian folk or you name it, fill in the blank folk. I don't think we want anything different than any of the rest of us. I don't think we want anything special, by mm -hmm. the way. I think we just want the equal shot. We'd like a safe home. We'd like a safe neighborhood. We'd like a good school. We'd like a good job. We might, we'd like to be able to afford to see a doctor. We'd like, to, we'd like to have food that can sustain us and not kill us. If we do need a prescription, we'd like to be able to actually pay for it while still paying for all the other things we need to stay alive. We need a car to get to work. And maybe, maybe we might be as greedy as we'd like to take a vacation once a year or so. Or even if it's just a long holiday, or I mean a long weekend, uh, and go somewhere. We all want the same damn thing. So why do you believe there is this chasm, it seems, between Philadelphia and Columbia County, between Pittsburgh and Mercer County, between the Lehigh Valley and Tioga County? Mm -hmm simply because I till a field for a living and you route electrical circuits as an electrical engineer, you and that farmer want the same things. So why, where, why is this chasm exist? Has the Democratic Party, especially in Pennsylvania, because there aren't these chasms in other states, there's farmers in New Jersey too. They don't hate Democrats in the same way. If they hate them at all, the party's done a better job there. Party's done a better job in Maryland. They might have a mm -hmm. Republican governor, but he's about as centrist as you get. Mm. What is the Democratic Party missing in Pennsylvania? Why is there this chasm, do you believe, between good, decent human beings in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and the Lehigh Valley and Scranton, Wilkes-Barre, compared to Cumberland County? And, and, and you know, I could start naming mm -hmm. random rural counties. Mm -hmm. Why? Why? why what is this? What is this phenomenon? Well, the phenomenon is that these areas and counties have been so divided by the current political discourse and have been told that they are each other's enemies and have been told this without actually seeing the other side. <laughs> Right, uh, people in Philadelphia call the rest of the state Pennsylvania, 
and people in rural counties call Philadelphia, Philadelphia, whatever, the, whatever you want to call it, right? All, all, the, all the historical names. Um, and in regards to the party, the party has not done enough to invest in local base building grassroots infrastructure so that you can build alternative relationships to move these people on their politics. I'm a firm believer that someone knocking on your door and having a conversation with you is the strongest influence that someone could be received politically. And the party is not knocking doors in a mass mobilizing way in a lot of these, a lot of these counties. So because they're not having someone come to their door and talk to them about their everyday issues, the thing they're listening to instead is Fox News. And so, and Fox News is telling them that Philadelphia is responsible for all their local problems in some magical way. And so that to me is the indictment. It's that we, that is that the narrative intentionally divides those two areas between urban and rural and the party has not done enough through mass grassroots mobilization, door-to-door -door operations, organizing political meetings, whatever, in a lot of these divided areas to build relationships and move them down a different political path. And until we do that, this is still gonna be the case, right? How, I mean, how, would, how should we expect someone in Cambria County to just miraculously have a revelation that, oh, all of my, deeply held beliefs about Philadelphia and black and brown people are so wrong. Oh my God, right? Um, people don't go down a path unless someone else pushes them down it. And we haven't been doing that enough as a party. 6.31 Eastern time here on the Kennedy Effect live for December 12, 2021. The remainder of this evening and one whole live show left for 2021 and then we enter our third calendar year our third anniversary of course will be in april but we'll be entering our third calendar year when we return to you live on january 9th the rest of today live show next week on the 19th and then we return to you on january 9th we will be having a what i hope will be a relatively relaxed fun uh, maybe there'll even be some ugly Christmas sweaters broken out. Uh, Roundtable discussion next week. That's our program. Nothing fancy. Roundtable discussion looking back at 2021 and looking ahead to what is going to be a very, very active, uh, uh, you know, politically speaking, I guess exciting might be the right word, but certainly busy. Uh, very, very busy 2022. Uh, wherever you might be across Facebook, thank you for being there. If you would like to join the conversation, come to our home group Facebook page, that other side of information, enter your comments and questions in the chat, and I will ask them. I will be putting up the phone number very, very shortly. You will be get to watch me type. It's always very exciting to watch me type uh, live on screen. Hot101.net web address is uh, our name, hot101.net, Apple App Store, Google Play Store, and the TuneIn radio app, and you can ask Alexa to play hot101.net and TCP, the culture professional from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, right here at home. We will be, oh, I will put the phone number up very, very shortly, 267-227-9189. For those of you playing along at home, 267-227-9189, 267-227-9189. Call me, yell, scream politely, uh, agree, disagree, ask a question the phone line will be open and I will type it on the screen very, very shortly. 267-227-9189. We continue with our honored guest, a first time guest. We've had a couple of repeat guests, but our first time guest is Rep Pennsylvania State Representative Rick Krajewski, 188, Philadelphia, the great city of philadelphia Great. rep amanda waldman a friend of mine friend uh from our revolution and former state rep candidate herself former and future mm. i think i don't think i'm breaking mm. any news there amanda if i did <laughs> Oops. whoops uh not only does our party not do the outreach work effectively they also believe that endorsing someone who has agreed to be 
a mouthpiece for the status quo is appropriate. I think that goes back to speaking to that group, uh, the Tiara and Sash wearing group in uh, asks the questions, does Amanda, how do we make our voices and opinions heard to these elitists, I think, I'm not sure who you're referring to. How do we organize against our voices being stolen by our own party and silenced by the GP GOP at the same time? Hmm. Um, I think lots to unpack there, but I always promise when I get questions, I will ask them. So those have come in the comments. So please have at it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the thing that has happened in, and Jeff, you, you, you called this out earlier, right? The party has been more beholden to corporate interest in grass top issues than mm -hmm. the grassroots. And one of the things that we've done in Philadelphia to push back against that and to take power back within the party is to build our own political infrastructure, right? So I had spoke earlier about Reclaim Philadelphia. Um, Reclaim Philadelphia is a grassroots progressive group that was formed after Bernie's 2016 campaign. It was volunteer people and staff that ran the campaign, saw the significance it had in moving our issues and decided to take that infrastructure and keep it running as a, as a local organization as within was, the party a local as was organization. Our revolution yep right yeah. right right as, as or, or exactly um and so groups like or and B claim and and even other groups that work within the party like dsa dsa candidates often run as democrats and in the base building that we've done we have built a political infrastructure that can contend with the party can beat it right we've defeated democratic incumbents and primaries and can be a source of inspiration and a source of a, and a political home for people who have not found it in the establishment democratic party as it is so to me the the solution is is ultimately a takeover right ultimately what we are fomenting here is we are building enough internal political machines that are more aligned with our values and the establishment and taking up space within the party until we have the influence to actually govern it. And so I think that kind of internal revolution is what we got to do. This is difficult, I think, uh, not just a difficult question, but I think a difficult thing to wrap your head around and, and to actually put into place. How do we do both, as it were? We know there's nothing Democrats can do that the current iteration of the Republican corporation is going to support, agree with, help, uh, publicize, give us credit for. Uh, if I, you know, I've been, I have been a Democrat since I came out of the womb. If I cured cancer tomorrow, it would be some type of socialist plot. Let's just be blunt, uh, you know, until a Republican took credit for it or a corporation whispered in the ears of the Republicans that it's a lot of money to be made on that. And then maybe they would support it. So we can't be our own enemy. But at times, the party, especially in Pennsylvania, is kind of the problem, but it's also the solution. How do we do both? Is it getting, is it what our revolution's trying to do? Is it what you're talking about? Getting involved in the party? Uh, Tom Hartman always says the most powerful person in the Democratic Party is the local precinct committee person. Is that what we need? We need our revolution people. We need reclaim Philadelphia people. We need DSA. We need, uh, uh, dare I say, even some Greens or whatever to get in the Democratic Party and restore it because it is the solution, but it's also the problem sometimes. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, to me, the answer is, is that what you just laid out of having political infrastructures develop inside the party to ultimately take it over. And that's not to, because I necessarily believe in that as a strategy at large, but is more so contending with the fact that we do live in the United States under a two party system that is deeply entrenched um and to me the path 
that's that leads most immediately to being able to have more power and to have more governing power is taking over the Democratic Party um, because of the apparatus that's there, because of positions like committee person, where someone can run for committee person and a very and in a very short of amount of time, a very short amount of time become a leader in their own community that can move 50, 100, 200 votes. That's a lot of power to get in an election that you could win with 30, 40 votes here in Philadelphia. And so to me, being able to move in and take out some of these long held positions that people didn't know about, right? People didn't know about the committee people as 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 positions right. in the first place. Um, and, it, and it's because the committee person didn't want you to know who they were, right? Because they didn't want you to run against them. And so to me, the path to most immediate governing power for us and for our values is being able to knock out those people and, and use those apparatuses for our agenda. The chair of the party in Philadelphia is very well known, is very well established and very is, powerful. Was he a help to you or a hindrance to you? Uh, when I was in, when I was a candidate, they supported the incumbent, so they, they were a hindrance. <laughs> um, now that you are the incumbent, you know, now that I'm the incumbent, you know, we have a relationship. Uh, would I say that I'm beholden to the chair? No, <laughs> um, because I don't feel I don't have any need to. Right, I built an independent political thing that I won on and continue and continue to govern under. So I don't need to be accountable to the chair. I'd like to collaborate and work together, but I don't need to listen to him because I didn't win using his help. And see, and that's the power of building those machines within that system, where now I'm in a position where I can work with them and I can move my agenda and take up space, but I'm not accountable to them, right? And so that that's how I would characterize that current, current situation. This is a tough question, considering that we both are members of said groups. Are there too many progressive groups? Um, yes, I think there are. I think there are. I cannot um, tell you how much I appreciate that answer. It's a discussion Kristen and I have all the time. And sometimes <laughs> she thinks I'm right. And sometimes she doesn't think I'm right. I think, let me use this. My math, I think is probably wrong. I think it would be probably more effective instead of having a thousand groups with 10 people, if we had 10 groups with a thousand people especially since so many of the policy positions and work is overlapping. And, and it seems to me that everybody's answer to, well, I have a chip on my shoulder and I have a problem with the Democratic Party. I'm going to start a group to, to either work against them or throw, you know, throw Molotov cocktails into the building and burn it down. You know, when you burn the house down, you're really only left with two things, a pile of ash and nowhere to live. Are there too many progressive groups? Do we need to really coalesce a bit more? There's not a million different right-wing groups. There just aren't. Mostly because most of the so-called right-wing grassroot, grassroots groups <laughs> grass root, <laughs> are corporately sponsored anyway, where we tend to sponsor ourselves. Mm -hmm. Are there too many groups? Uh. Yes, there are. There are too many groups because there are too many groups that, in my opinion, I'm not even just because of just existing, but there are too many groups that redundantly exist. Um, I think there are many groups that are aligned enough in values and demands and issues that they could coalesce and become a larger collective. But I think that that's a reflection of a country that is inherently very individualistic but and, and kind of tribalistic also, right? We want to, I mean, and this is a lot of the tribalism, they, you know, and this is going back to the, to, to the Republican Party. The Republican Party pushes tribalism, packages populism, right? And um, I think that a lot of us suffer from that in our own kind of silly grassroots non profit way, where we all think we have to have our own 
individual project because our idea is different from that other idea when it probably really isn't that different. No, uh, I mean, that's the thing. When there's, you know, nation, not even to talk about nationwide, just here in, 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 in PA, you know, there's probably a hundred groups working on healthcare. Why? Yeah. Why? Maybe we only need, honestly, maybe we only need one. Yeah. And there's, you know, 50 groups working on voting. Why? <laughs> All of you need to go join a new Pennsylvania project and you can all carry one flag. And by the end of the day, you know, all the environmental groups, conservation voters, mm -hmm. you're good. You're good. Mm -hmm. Go mm -hmm. talk to them. Right. And by the time it's all said and done, there might be five big groups left, maybe 10. That'd be great. And we'll get more done. And make my, I, I don't know, I'd have less meetings also. It'd make well, my life a lot easier. <laughs> you have more time to come here. Exactly. Uh, you just know, that's what we look forward to every day. What, and folks, the phone line is open. Let me give it to you. To, uh, if you're looking at your screen, you see that lovely graphic there. At the bottom of that graphic, if the closed captions aren't killing it for you, um, I'll put it in my square too, because as I look at the closed captions that are automatically generated by Facebook, they're kind of drowning out the phone number. So I will give it to you. It is 267-227-9189, 267 9189 267-227-9189. And this is not the kind of thing I usually do on the air. Okay, good. I can hear everything. You might be able to hear that test too. I usually don't do that. I usually don't do that live on the air like that. But because I had so many problems earlier, I want to make sure I can actually hear the phone ring. I will also put it in my square as well. I'm going to ask you another tough question, where at least I think it's tough. What is the Republican platform? Hmm. Um, that's a, it's a, it's a very open-ended question. Uh, to me, the it also presupposes that that platform exists. I don't know that it does. I think it does. I think it certainly it does. Um, and I think it exists, but I think it exists in, in terms of values more so than political positions, right? Um, I think that the Republican platform includes uh, the belief that government should do as little as possible in advancing the interest of the private market, the private, private corporations. It believes that individual freedom is more important than collective good. It believes that Christian hegemony is 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 totally fine in the political arena um and it believes that i find it amazing how many folks because you and i talked about information and, and education earlier when i show people the opening line of the treaty of tripoli are you is it something you're familiar with no not not exactly no. i will i will try to find the graphic for it I, george might 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 have it but i kind of don't think so it, I, and I'm going to butcher it, so I'm paraphrasing, folks. You can feel free to send me the quote uh, so I get it 100% correct, but I'm paraphrasing here. The opening of the Treaty of Tripoli, which is the first, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's the first treaty that the United States signed on to as a nation. Mm. Uh, the treaty to, you know, because it was also our first foreign military action as we sent U.S. naval ships to protect trade off of you know the barbary pirates off of this you know the uh the libyan and somalian coasts but the treaty of tripoli all the way around the horn of africa by the way uh the northern coast of africa we, we sent u.s naval ships to protect commerce uh, because mm -hmm. they were being pirated um and the treaty of tripoli says that whereas the united states is not found on found on the christian religion not yeah. found right. Right. on the Christian religion and goes on to say as a, we have no inherent biases or, uh, you know, in modern language, we have no problem with Muslims. How many folks don't know that, but yet somehow we're, we're trying to form this, as you expertly said, really, this Christian homogeny. But do they really, do the power people, I have no doubt that the self-identified Republican on the street and i always say self-identified because if you really actually talk to them about an economic message they don't agree with any of it 
yeah. progressive policies poll in the 60s and 70s and sometimes even 80s in percent favor of progressive economic policies, but they have been drowned and swayed, uh, you know, almost dyed a red color in these quote unquote social issues. The number of self-identified Republicans I've talked to about guns and you want to take my gun. I don't care if you have a hundred guns. I don't care. I don't care if your attic is absolutely full of them. I don't care if you have an armory up there. I hope you have them locked and I hope you can keep them away from your kids. I'd like you to do some radically socialist things like eat and see a doctor (laughs) and they have nothing, nothing to return back with. So when, when, when we talk about this, you know, limited government and free market. Oh, by the way, what's a free market in PA when it comes to energy when you're handing $3 billion to fossil right. fuels? Is it truly like free? It. Yeah, it really, really doesn't sound like a free market to me. Right. It's free for them. Right. It's free for them, and then it's all profit. But that doesn't sound like a, a free market. It sounds like, you know, what Republicans always scream about, about picking winners and losers in the market. Well, yeah, when you, when you make one industry essentially free, you are picking a winner and loser. But again... I, I know I'm getting repetitive. Is this the, the person on the street might believe it, but do you really think the people in power, the people that the employees of the Republican corporation, which are the elected officials, we know who the owners are. Mm-hmm. That makes them the employees. That's why I call it a corporation because they're mm-hmm. the top 1% and the big corporation owns it. They're the stockholders. They're the owners. They're the investors. Right. And the, and the party apparatus and the elected official, they're the employees. Their only job seems to be to steer as much money toward the top 1% as humanly possible. That's why I said they don't have a platform. The national, the RNC actually just voted, I think it was a week ago or two weeks ago, that they will have no national platform going into the midterm elections. None. Crazy. Zero. Crazy. So Truly while, insane. while the self-identified Republican man, on, man or woman on the street might really really you know dig into the to the to the items that you listed out do the people in power believe this or is it simply a vehicle to get what they want it's definitely a vehicle to get what they want right i mean like it's just um it it, it's just a way to put forward an agenda that personally benefits them and i think that that is obvious to anyone who pays even a little bit of attention. Um, but they have, I mean, again, they have, they have a, a media and narrative monopoly in a lot of these places. And so they can get away with making it seem as though they're working in the interests of their communities, even though they're not. And I think that's the thing that is so dangerous about this moment is that we are not going to be able to change these things until we actually get in a lot of these rural areas and and show a different path. No one again, no one's going to just in you know uh, change their frame of mind without someone pushing them to do so. And right now it's not happening. So these people can get away with these bold-faced lies because no one's telling these people otherwise. George was kind enough. He must have been feverishly (laughs) typing and Googling. Unless I've sent that to you before and I don't even remember sending it, uh, the opening of the Treaty of Tripoli was signed into law by then President John Adams, June 10th of 1797, uh, as the government uh, of the United States, as the government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the christian religion is the beginning you can read the rest of it there and remember folks in the constitutional uh congress one of the biggest debates that took place during the entire constitutional congress was the debate between jefferson i believe madison was with him on this and so and especially the southern delegates and it was a debate over one word and that was of or from right that rick knows exactly what i'm talking about we ended up with the language in the constitution for the freedom of religion 
Jefferson argued for freedom from religion. Right. One can only, uh, uh, one must only wonder in whatever alternative history uh, how different the country would be um, if uh, Jefferson had won the day. He won a lot of days. He didn't win that day, but he won a lot Not of that days. that one, unfortunately. And if right. we continue to fight the of versus from battle to this day. <laughs> exactly. I know you have to go at seven. That's five minutes from now. Um, I want to do what I traditionally do and give uh, when a guest has to go or as we, you know, sometimes approach the end of a program, but I want to just turn the floor open to you and mm. step out of the way. Mm. Is there... We didn't get much of a chance, if any chance, really to talk about any pending legislation. We certainly didn't mm. get to talk about voting. Um, mm. You know, if the United States, if and or when it splits again between the old Confederacy and the old North, I don't know where Pennsylvania would fall in that right now. Uh, we've had all the moves in the legislature for uh, to take all, nearly all the power of the vote on to the Republican caucus. And so that they decide who wins and loses elections, not voters and not election officials and not the Department of State. We didn't get to that. There's so much we didn't get to. I just wanna open the floor to you and let you have at it. If there's something that we did not get to get to, something we did get mm. to talk to, but you didn't think that we really closed out that point Mm. And finally, how can folks find you, reach you, follow you, work with you, all of sure. the above? So the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and thank you again for having me. Uh, I really appreciate the time in our conversation. Uh, the thing that I want to leave people with when I think about my experience in the legislature so far is that while things are very dire, and I'm not going to minimize right, the stakes that we see ourselves in right now in this political moment. There are things that I hold on to as sources of hope and opportunities to, to forge forward. Um, like I said, me being able to come into the legislature as a freshman legislator and be clear eyed and bold about what I believe in, in my positions as a person and as an elected official, and to not be ostracized and alienated, but to in fact be able to join right a, a real progressive squad that includes Rep. Rab, Representative Fiedler, Rep. Summer Lee, Rep. Inamorado, Senator Sabal, right? We have many people who can now act as a collective to push forward things like a housing repairs program that would put in millions of dollars into home weatherization and home repairs as a way of pushing a Green New Deal for housing, right? That can create a rubric of uh, the kind of bills that we will not support as, as bold progressive electeds. And to use that to not just inform our own politics, but to move our, our, our colleagues as well. Um, being able to do that fills me with a lot of hope and shows me that there is a path forward and being able to continue to build internal infrastructure as a means of, of taking over and pushing the Democratic Party. And on top of that, the other thing that I, I, I and I hold on to that hope because there's a lot coming up at stake next year, right? We have a governor's race, we have a Senate race, we have an opportunity to pick up more seats in the legislature. The entire and, congressional delegation, the right. legislature, Senate, yep. And so, we have to come up with a bold, inspiring agenda and a program. And I feel grateful to be in some position to be able to inform that because we have to. Um, true, I, truly the future of Pennsylvania is at stake next year. Um, so I'm gonna continue to be working on both my political side and legislative side to be a part of that. And to speak on how folks can get in touch with me. Uh, so. Um, we have uh, on our legislative side, we have social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Rep Krajewski, we're on Twitter and Instagram is that handle. If you just look up Representative Rick Krajewski, you can find us on Facebook. And then on my campaign side, 
you can follow our political accounts at Rick for West Philly. Or sorry, it's actually Rick for Philly now. We changed it to Rick for Philly on Twitter, Instagram, and I believe on Facebook, I'm just as Rick Kuczewski. And you can follow those to see all the legislation we're doing. Like I said, we're working on a home repairs program bill with Senator Saval. Um, we've been working to push the budget uh, the budget season that's coming up and that call for a billion dollars to be put into school remediation to make sure that our schools are healthy and have the infrastructure they deserve. And I serve on uh, the health and environmental and resources committees, and I will continue to be a champion for our environment for reproductive justice in those spaces. So I would just say stay tuned and, and see what we get up to next year. Well, I have bad news for you before you go. What's that? You are part of the family now. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. And, uh, because there's so much that we didn't get a, an opportunity to get to. I beg you, please let this not be the only time that you come to visit us. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I think is, is desperately, desperately lacking in the Commonwealth is progressive media. Yes. Um, we are we are some of, if not the only call in interactive live progressive media in this Commonwealth. And for the seventh largest state in the union with the seventh largest city, that's yeah. not a great thing. It's bad. Um, you know, and all are welcome here. Republicans have called. I've had Republican guests. We've disagreed, and that's fine. At the end of the day, we smile, shake hands, and walk away. And there's a severe lack of that happening in our Commonwealth as well. The, the disagreement isn't the problem. Yeah. You know, it's it's that we don't even talk enough to disagree. So, I hope that I very desperately hope that you will come back and see us again uh, in the future. The door is always welcome to you if there is a crucial you, if there's like a crucial pending issue that you just need to get to folks about you let me know you're here say your piece and then i'll release you back to your sunday but please you. you know please know that you are welcome here and uh, i just very very much hope this is not the only time that we see you you're part of the family and all families always welcome Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate thank you for it. Thank being you again for your time. Hey, and thank you for being so, so, so patient at the beginning. No problem. I mean, that was above and beyond the call. I no really problem. appreciate it. Yes, absolutely. Please take All care right. of yourself and stay healthy. Thank you, Jeff. You do the same. Take care. Have a wonderful holiday. Thank you so you much. Too. Bye now. That's Rep. Rick, Rep. Rick Krajewski. Uh, and I believe me, I mean it. He could not have been more patient at the beginning. I mean, every freaking thing <laughs> wrong i couldn't hear anything i couldn't no i mean nothing was responding it was dreadful i mean it was an absolute just it was a crap show let's just be blunt it was a and i was freaking out properly freaking out because i didn't know if we were going to be here today i didn't know if i'd be able to get everything rocking and rolling but we did Thank goodness. I mean, I'll tell you what, I don't know. I have, a, I have a, it's not a simple system necessarily here, um, but it's not horribly complicated. I mean, we don't have a, we don't have a, <laughs> we don't have a proper radio studio here where you've, you've may have seen, um, I'm sure you've all seen, you know, footage of of your favorite band back in the day recording something in the massive mixing boards and so on. We have none of that here. Uh, we have uh, some strung up computers that are, you know, tied together. They work together. I have a very small mixing board because I still haven't gotten the big one to work. Um, but basically, it's it, it's pretty homemade. Uh, you know, George has been brilliant making everything work and making sure we don't blow fuses and overheat things and all that fun stuff. But boy, this morning, or this morning, not that it feels like this morning, um, you know, when I sat down here at about 4.45 to start sharing things out, 
and I just realized nobody could hear me. I couldn't hear them. None of the background was playing. The theme song wouldn't play. I wasn't, we couldn't get out to Facebook, like all this stuff. The, 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 the theme song and the background noises that you might be hearing right now would not play. Uh, just, uh, I couldn't get the radio software to hot one one to boot up. I mean, just everything completely went pear-shaped. And uh, that's the ancient Gaelic, by the way, it went pear-shaped. So it just went absolutely pear-shaped. And I had everybody on. Everybody was here on Zoom. And I had to tell a sitting state rep, I'm going to hang up on you right now. And then I'm going to redo everything. <laughs> and I really, really hope you call back in. And he did. And he's a man of his word. And that's not a small thing, by the way, because uh, we did have that scheduling mix up a couple months ago, month, month and a half ish ago. And he promised he'd be here and he did it. And then boy, when he did show up, I had to make him wait and wait and wait. Um, so at least we got the time that we did. And um, I have every confidence that he will come back uh, and talk to us again. 267-227-9189 is the phone number, 267-227-9189, 267-227-9189, phone line is open. It is 7.05 Eastern Time, our penultimate live program for 2021. France is going to love the fact that I use the word penultimate. Uh our penultimate live program for 2021, 706 Eastern Time. This is the Kennedy Effect Live for December 12th, 2021. Uh, we will be here with you perhaps for another hour. Uh, we'll see if we get phone calls, comments, and questions in the chat. Uh, and then we will return live next week, December the 19th. We will be having a uh, what I hope will be a bit of a relaxed and fun uh, round table discussion. Uh, we will probably have a variety of round table contributors drifting in and out of the program. Uh, two of which that I know are going to be here already, of course, are two of our favorites and two of our dear friends and family of the program. Sergeant Thomas Mack is scheduled to be back with us next week, as well as Connor O'Hanlon. And other additional invitations are pending and out to the public uh, for potential roundtable participants. Uh, I'm sure Kristen will be here. George will be here. I'm hoping to have April here in studio uh, next week to be a part of this as well. And I will probably end up inviting because I always tend to over invite and I'm because I'm afraid folks won't show up. And as, as good as I am at talking, uh, I cannot always um, hold uh, multiple hours uh, of talking on my own. So we, there might be 10 people that float through that uh, round table discussion by the time I'm done uh, uh, inviting folks. I've invoked, uh, I know Sergeant Mack and, and Connor are supposed to be here and I've invited, I think, I'm trying to do it in my head, one, two, at least three others and I probably will invite more. Uh, so it might be a rotating uh, set of guests uh, coming through next week. We wanna look back at uh, 2021. We want to look ahead to what is going to be a very, very busy, um, I guess, if you're into politics, exciting year. Uh, if you work in politics, it's kind of exciting. It's going to be an exhausting year, uh, but it's going to be something. It's going to be a hell of a year in 2022 from uh, so much, so much of, uh, as Rep. Rick said, uh, not just the future of the Commonwealth, you know, he mentioned that the future of Pennsylvania is going to be decided in 2022. I agree with him. Uh, but to a great extent, the future of the country is going to be decided in 2022. Will we elect more? Will Republicans take the House? Will they take back the Senate? Will they grind the country to a halt if they do with a Democratic president in the White House? Will more, even if the Republicans do take over, will it be more of the fascist wing that takes over. Will we have more? You heard Matt Gates say this week that he's spoken to Trump about being the next speaker of the house. Could you imagine? Could you imagine a Matt Gates being speaker of the house? A man who supported the January 6th insurrection, a man who wanted to end government 
being that far in control of it. Because I'm telling you, folks, that's the hypocrisy here. Republicans don't want to end the government. They really actually want to control it because they get rich that way. And the people that own them get rich that way. So 2022 is going to be just something. I mean, it is something. I would even speculate to say that the next three election cycles, the next three years, the mid, the congressional cycle coming up in 2022, a gubernatorial cycle coming up here in PA, the local elections and judicial elections again coming up in 2023, and then of course the presidential cycle in 2024. These next three election cycles will probably go the distance to determining if this nation continues as we have known it or whether it ends. President Biden held his democracy summit this week and talked about declining democracies around the world. The United Nations has listed the United States as a backsliding democracy. We've never been listed like that before. We are considered now around the world as a back sliding democracy. That democracy itself, that our form of government, our representative form of government is at risk. That's, think about that. And again, a word I've become to uh, I've come to use a lot recently is hyperbole. It's not hyperbole. This is these are these are ingrained. These are ingrained international institutions looking at the U.S. from the outside and saying that the United States as the world has known it may cease to exist, that our form of government may cease to exist. So there's that that we can discuss. The line is open 267-227-9189, 267-227-9189. I would also encourage all of you in the chat to wish George a happy birthday. It is, uh, we are technically past his birthday, but this is the closest program to his birthday. So we wish him a happy birthday. Uh, for a man who has somehow been my friend for two decades and yet still only 29 years old is a really amazing thing. Um, and married at 29, I mean, amazing, you know, all that fun stuff. Uh, you know, he is younger than me, just about everyone is. And he's in better shape than me. Um, and just about everyone is. Uh, it's France reminds me via text that Gates, oh, I'm in the wrong app. Oh, goodness. Very not smooth. That Gates was uh, floating Trump to be Speaker of the House. Well, that's true. Yes, that's true. Uh, don't think Gates wouldn't take it if it was offered him. That's for damn sure. I do think you're going to I, I do think if Republicans do take over the House and history says that they will. But if they do, because the vote still has to take place yet. And an awful lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I think whatever reports come out of the 1-6 commission are going to greatly affect the midterm elections. But that said, if, if history holds and Republicans are able to take over uh, Congress, 
especially the House, I think you're going to see a Republican civil war. Kevin McCarthy has allowed his membership to do just about everything but club baby seals on the floor of the house. And he'd probably allow that because he doesn't care about such things anyway, because he desperately, desperately, all media reports have said this for no matter the, no matter the outlet, newspaper, radio, cable news, you name it, all of them have said that he wants nothing more in life than to be speaker of the house. That's why he has placated the Boberts and Taylor Greens and Gateses and Gosars of the world because he just doesn't want to anger any of the Republican caucus because he desperately, desperately, desperately wants to be speaker. But there's some in the nut job caucus in the outright fascist caucus who still don't like Kevin McCarthy. And if that group is able to take the house in 22, they will feel emboldened. And they just might be the ones to push their own nominee for speaker, whether it's Gates himself or Trump or fill in the blank. There's quite a number. And the constitution says, by the way, that the speaker of the house does not even need to be an elected member of the body itself. An outside individual can be speaker. So don't be surprised if there is not a full Republican bloodbath over the speakership. There may be none. I very well could be wrong about it. But don't be surprised if it happens. Two six seven two two seven nine one eight nine two six seven two two seven nine one eight nine. Let me quickly get to the Facebook page that I can uh, understand. That's not what I meant to say. That I can have a peek. At the um, let's see if I can see some of the articles that I have put up for you this week. Your time trying to get through my apps here. Where did that open? Fighting with my own apps, folks. Okay, there we go. That's what I meant to do. Let's have a peek at some of the uh, articles that we sent, have sent around so far this week. Uh, looks like we might only make it to 7.30 with you folks. <laughs> Everything seems to have ground to a halt. George actually just posted an article earlier, uh, about 20 minutes ago. Um, NASA's asteroid impact. Um, I almost said satellite. That's not really what I meant. They're, they're um, robotic mission to impact an asteroid to see what it's uh, the deflector ensuring that nasa's dark kinetic impactor asteroid deflector hits its target an explanation it appears to be an explanation of how the mission is going to work you can correct me george anytime you wish um, what nasa has done is they are electing they're electing <laughs> i'm so deep into politics right now they have sent this this um, robotic probe probe was the word i was digging for in my brain and i wasn't finding it uh to an asteroid where they are going to launch this projectile into it in an attempt to find out if we can deflect uh near earth bodies away from impacting the planet that is a really butchered explanation of it, but that is what's happening. It is the opening, um, some opening investigative science here as to whether we can take an asteroid headed toward the planet that could wipe out, either come close to wiping everything out or, uh, 
or or go a long way to wiping it all out if that could be deflected and never hit the pro, hit the planet in the first place this is a really important piece of science and quite frankly it under it underscores the the very deep 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 need for uh, an agency like nasa spacex uh, blue origins all the private space was never going to spend their money to try to save the planet from an asteroid. That's where government steps in. And that's why NASA is so important. And that's why these, these private space joyriders are not helping anybody. They're not helping anybody. This is, this is a job for the government. It's a job for NASA. And we all should be very, very happy as such things are taking place. Randall is on the line. Randall, happy Sunday. How are you? I'm doing great, Jeff. Um, and I hope you and your family are. And, and I want to say happy birthday to uh, George's upcoming birthday. Um, just real quick, couple things. Your uh, Facebook page. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it was there from the beginning. Well, that yeah. Well, no, we never made it. The part that you saw get to Facebook is after I rebooted the whole system. Uh, okay, I but, came out on 504. Yeah, but I, well, yeah, I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What happens, what happens, I don't want to drown anybody with, you know, inside baseball stuff. It's, it's, it's actually quite boring, but considering the fact that Facebook has some of the greatest computer programmers and most talented and skilled computer programmers on the planet, you cannot share something to multiple places at the same time. You have to do it one by one by one by one by one. So what we normally do is we start our Facebook feed. If you're a regular watcher, viewer, listener of the program, we start our Facebook feed sometimes as early as 4.45 p.m., a full 15 minutes before we go live. Uh, on Hot 101 and TCP and so on and so on. Because I have to share the pro, that 100 shares happens individually. I have to share it 100 times. And it takes a while. And you can't start right at five o'clock, uh, can't start promptly at 5 p.m. if it's taking me 10 minutes to share the thing all over the place. So what you saw is after we rebooted the system and actually got it working. We never made it to Facebook the first time. <laughs> when I wanted, you know, the early time when I wanted to share everything, you got the late time. That's why we didn't start till I think 517. Uh, we usually start right at 5, 5 p.m., 501, maybe 502. Occasionally we give people, uh, we actually do Zoom etiquette believe it or not, for the beginning of the program, we give people a few minutes to be late <laughs> before we start normally, but not 17 minutes. That wasn't part of problem. That wasn't part of the plan. I can guarantee you. But anyway, that's a lot inside baseball stuff. So what else do you have on your mind, Randall? Um, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? What else Jeff? do you have on your mind? I, I, you had, you had a, I had to leave, I guess, about five, ten for you know, for normal Sunday family dinner. And uh, I actually got back earlier tonight to pick up again. I just left uh, my Facebook on uh, the whole time to show there's at least one person watching on your Facebook page. Um, what can that be? I guess I should say. Uh, anyway, I, I, it was really good to hear a progressive right next in the county next, next door to me, Philadelphia County, here in Delaware County. It's really good to hear an elected 30 year old millennium. Um, my, my youngest of three daughters just turned 30. And my, my two older daughters are in their mid 30s. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm well aware of millenniums. And I, I, I work. I worked my whole life in colleges and universities, so <laughs> yeah. and I've been retired uh, from Cabrini University. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm familiar with the millennials and, and the earlier generations as they were growing up 
and colleges, universities. So it's, it's good. To, it's good to hear incredible, young, vibrant, intelligent millennials. Yep. That are progressives, and your whole point you made earlier on we need to combine different progressive movements. I mean. I think I'm on like eight indivisible just here in Southeast PA Facebook pages. Uh, I don't know how many pages I'm on for voting rights. And so that, that was a good point you made tonight, Jeff. Thank you, sir. What else you got? What else you got, Randall? Or is that, was that, getting us good no i'm trying to think when you had <laughs> i'm trying to think when you had the gal on or actually there's a couple of ladies i think and we were talking about the environment and marineries and the other pipelines from fracking right that was katie that was katie bloom about uh two months goodness ago. yeah probably about two months ago already yeah yeah okay as as over the, you know, as over the years happen, as we see worse and worse drought conditions at different points and different times in our country, as we see worse wildfires at different points and different times in our country, as we see flooding at different times, different points in our country, and, and, and now summer tornadoes, F3, F4, F5s, occurring in December, if that's not a wake-up call for climate change caused by global warming, I don't know what the, what does. I, I, I read two articles there of, of major flooding in Europe, different parts of Europe today. Um, it just I can't, well, know. let's let's think about it this way, uh, Randall, because I actually got a message through that there's another uh, someone else that wants to ring in. But let's think about it this way. You you are um, I'll be 53 in June. You are 60. I'm 69. 69. I'll be 70 in August. OK, so when you were a kid. How many tornadoes do you remember? Well, I grew up in Wichita, Kansas, so I was 10. Okay, well, that's a crappy, that's a that's a trick question, Randall. You baited me for that one, and I will forever hold it against you. But I grew up here in the Lehigh Valley. If we even got a tornado warning, it was news that we talked about for weeks. There we was got never any tornadoes back here. After my father was transferred with Boeing, uh, when I was in second semester of fifth grade and 11 years old, there was never for decades any tornadoes ever reported. Even out in the flatlands, like Lancaster County and stuff. Never. And, it's been, and I think the first tornado hit here in Delaware County and it was an F1, and it was just up the street from where I lived at that time. Uh, that was like incredible. And that, but it wasn't until '91, and I moved here in '63. So yeah, now we had that we had that one time this summer. Or what was it? Twelve tornado warnings in the tri-state area. And well, the, over the over this past summer, they came. Basically, we would get a few a week. We would sometimes get a couple a week, especially with the um, how hot the weather was. We would get we you know when the days that you would get thunderstorm warnings, a tornado warning generally came with it. My point is is that when I was a kid and I'm talking like out in the neighborhood playing with my buddies, you know, pre, you know, 
pre-video game, all that fun stuff, you know, wiffle ball, nerf football, all that fun stuff. I can remember, you know, basically from like, I don't know, seven years old to maybe 13, 14. I can remember maybe one tornado warning in the Lehigh Valley and only once, only once in the entire time that I was growing up, did I ever see hail. I remember my dad getting down, picking up a whole handful of it and saying, this is ice. And it was the middle of June and it was 90 something degrees out. And I said, it can't be ice. It's summer. He goes, no, it's ice. You need to feel it. And he was trying to explain to me the phenomena of hail. And hail itself has become a, a regular occurrence in our local weather. If you, I'm, I'm agreeing with you in a very long-winded way, because that's why I do radio. I'm very long-winded. But if you can't see that there has been a change in climate, then you're simply not paying attention. Or you have been so, so tainted by the deniers. Let's think about it, folks. Think about the folks that are denying climate change. They're the only ones that are going to profit from there being no change in the way that we do things. Moving away from fossil fuels is not radical. It is also not impossible. I beg you to think of this. How many folks do you see walking down your main street and lighting the gas lamps at night when it gets dark? The answer is none, because we moved away from gas lamps to electricity. How many horses and buggies do you see transporting people? Not in farm areas, but actually transporting people. As the main source of transportation, how many people do you see in horses and buggies? How many trains are run by steam? When's the last time you took a canal boat to Philadelphia? <laughs> we moved past all of these things. Do you still wash your clothes by beating them on a rock in the local stream? Technology moves forward. Not only can we move away from fossil fuels, we have to before we're all dead. There is a mass extinct, extinction event happening on this planet right now. The difference between this one and all the others is that we have caused this one. We did not cause the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs or the Permian when the, uh, when the planet was radically changing in temperature between Ice Age and Tropical Hothouse. We are causing this one. We're causing it. That's the difference between this extinction and all the others. And the other difference between this extinction and all the others, we're here for it and we won't survive it. Randall, what else you got? I'm going to clear the line open. I think somebody else is trying to get through. Well, I'm, I'm going to let you go because I'm glad somebody else is calling. <laughs> I'm, you. I'm glad because I get tired of the call because nobody else will. You're a, not, 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 that I get, not that I really... Yeah, careful I, now. I, You're going to walk that one back. Careful now. Walk that back. Get tired of calling. <laughs> get easy there. <laughs> All right. Jeff... You and your family, God bless, and have a great weekend. Thank you for being uh, a regular here and for being so loyal and so kind with your words. We appreciate it. You know, one of these days, Randall, I'm going to meet you in person. We're going to have a pint. Yeah, that would be great sometime. <laughs> All right, my friend. You stay healthy yeah, down there, you and, and, and the family. You stay healthy. We'll talk to you next week. All right. Bye-bye, Jeff. All right. Be well. What a good man. What a great man so kind that he's you know 
calls every week. Shows you all folks how easy it is at home to call. It doesn't hurt a bit, promise. Even if you disagree, it doesn't hurt a bit. One of the one of my favorite memories of this program is, is the young man who called me from Central PA and tried to tell me how the election was stolen. Talked to him for an hour. It's one of the best conversations I've ever had on this program. If you didn't get to hear it, it's um, go to YouTube. You'll find it. Area code 570, you are on the program. Your first name, where are you calling from, and welcome. Hey, Jeff, it's Amanda. Hey, Miss Amanda. Did I break any news for you? No. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't give away the I was going to say, I'm glad I didn't give anything away. <laughs> that wasn't my plan. <laughs> what do you got? Talk to the world. So I wanted to go back to the downsliding democracy, and I know we want to blame that all on the Republicans, but our beloved Democratic Party itself has a very serious problem with messaging. And in their serious problem with messaging effectively to the people, right? they also have a habit of discounting people's choice by uh, endorsing candidates to primaries. And in this specific upcoming election, they're considering actually endorsing a candidate who is not even a candidate yet. They have not announced that they're even going to run. But in January, they will be asked to endorse this person. I'm not going to, you know, throw any other candidate under the bus or, you know, right. stepping out of line to, you know. Let me ask person. you, let me ask you this question, because it's very interesting. This is a, this is a, a, a conversation that, that Kristen and I had during the week. And uh, I, I swear some of our uh, conversations are not nearly as pedantic as this. And some of them are much more enjoyable. Um, I promise. Um, let me ask you this, because this is a discussion that we had. There are many, many outside groups, progressive outside groups, that will do these uh, seminars, webinars, trainings, fill in the blank, on messaging. Even the party itself uh, does messaging training. So here's my question. Do we not know how to message or is nobody just getting off of their collective arses and doing it i think we really have a serious problem taking our message out of this utopian future that we see um we care about everyone we care about everyone's issues our groups are very diverse from trans communities lgbt lgbtq to women's rights, to Black Lives Matter. Um, we care about everyone's people. And we talk about our goals and what we want to see happen and our policies in this idealized um, language instead of daily life language. We don't get to the kitchen table in most homes because our ideals are so lofty sometimes. I know why I'm a Democrat. I know why my neighbors are Republican. I know that my Democratic family members don't have these kitchen table discussions about the Build Back Better plan or the infrastructure package. Um, we talk about this someday future, but not how we're gonna get there. But my Republican neighbors have specific conversations about specific bills, specific things that affect their life tomorrow. And we need to figure out how to message so that our packages, our policies, our bills are talked about at the kitchen table every night and how it's going to impact someone tomorrow. Does that make sense? It does, but let me ask you kind of a, this is another semi-argument that we have slash discussion. When you say that we're the ones that care about everybody's issues, I would say, I, I don't know if you mean that in a bad way, but we are. No, I mean it in a good way. So I mean it in the best way. 
So our policies, we try and be comprehensive for everyone. We try and do the most good for the most number of people. Um, we try and improve the lives of everyone, not just a specific group. We want everyone's lives to improve. We have wanted everyone's lives to improve a century or more. Um, it's just the way we talk now, we lose voters because they don't think we're engaged in their daily life. While it's not true, you and I know this. I was gonna, I'm glad we, you, I'm glad you got to that part of it, yeah. Messaging that to them right now. When, and when do we have to- Republicans talk, they, they talk about a fear of something today. Um, right, the fear, the fear of the day, the outrage of the day, and believe right. and believe it or not, I know it's it's um, ah, oh, damn it, what's the name of the and rule? They, the first one, what's the name of the rule that the first one who invokes Nazism loses the argument? Uh, there's a name for that. I'm forgetting the name of that now. <laughs> that's the basic what you negate, you. you yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but there's a name. There's a name for that. It's like it's like Robert's Law or something like that. The first one who invokes Nazism loses the argument. But it is Goebbels' technique that you 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 come up with an outrage per day. You come up with a fear per day, and that the fear on Monday has to be worse and more outrageous than the one on Sunday, which is then you know the one on Tuesday is more outrageous than the one on 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 Monday. Um, but we are the party that seem, that tries at least to care about everybody. They're, they're fantastic at taking that fear and applying it to your daily life. So, Bert Keller is currently my congressman, which is so fun. Um, Fred frequently will post about the gas prices and low-income families in this district, 12th district. Lake Cumming County is where I'm at, where I'm running. And we do have a significant population that are at poverty level. And that is a significant problem is that people can't afford to get the gas to get to work in work. Those are the, those who are working. Godwin's um, law. That's what it is. George has told me. It's Godwin's law. He's right. Okay. Damn it. I knew that. And that is something, it's the buy and demand. Biden didn't raise gas prices. It's not bad policy, it's supply and demand. The fact that we're not producing to the demand level right now. Across the, across the globe, we're not producing at demand level. This is not President Biden, but every day there's a new vote from an elected GOP person, state rep, state senator, congressman, whatever it may be, about how the Democrats are making it impossible for you to get to work because you can't afford the gas. You can't afford to heat your house because of the Democrats. They're fantastic at taking that fear of not being able to make ends meet, not being able to survive, and pinning it on us. I'm not saying we need to, in turn, figure out how to pin everything back on them. I'm saying our message is getting so lost in the voice. People don't know what we actually stand for. And they believe the loud GOP who has fear beef everything. When do we have to stop being nice? <laughs> when do we, we have to stop? Nice when we can. No, look, we uh, <laughs> look, I think you you campaign as a Democrat, you campaign to your own party, you mm -hmm. campaign to independents, you campaign to non affiliated. You campaign to disaffected Republicans. But when you walk down the street or you're at that table at the county fair or, uh, 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 you know, marching in that parade and, you know, they're quite literally throwing things at you. Um, at what point, you know, when the, the MAGA hats and the and the F Biden flag carriers and when do we stop being nice? Because we're not there's nothing, 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 nothing. We're ever going to say to those folks to sway them. So when do we stop being nice to them 
start explaining to them exactly who they are because the other folks around that discussion are going to hear it too. And supposedly this is a group of people who, who admire strength. When do we start telling them exactly who the hell they are and where the hell they can go and why everything that they stand up for is exactly why they're in the position that they're in. We have a guy who lives around here. Chris and I have seen him. He wears all these clothes in an American flag pattern. He has a bicycle with a, uh, what I guess you would call is a cart on the back where he puts his child. And there's Trump flags all over it and everything else. The man doesn't work. And the only time I see him on the bike is when he's riding from his rental home to the liquor store. But he's convinced we're the enemy. Now, we're also the ones keeping him alive because Republicans, he's a taker. He's not a maker. He's a taker. They don't care if that man lives or dies, except when it's time for him to vote. So I guess my question is, when I get myself in an argument with that guy, because it's coming, <laughs> when do I stop being nice to him and have the stones to look him in the face and say, you're an absolute blooming, blithering idiot? And here's why. Because the other people around that discussion are going to hear that. So you tell me, when do we do that? Okay, so you're hitting on a couple of things. One, it sounds like this man is living well below poverty. He's a taker, not a giver. He by Republicans' failing. own definition. Okay, by, by Republicans' talking points, he is only failing in life because Democrats screwed him somehow. He has fallen into that anger, that hate, that fear. That it's our fault that he failed, not his own. Zero responsibility. One. And two, another thing you're hitting on is, when did standing up for yourself become me? Well, that's exactly my point. Yeah, standing up for yourself is because, not being mean. See, because when that you guy... When you attack someone, right, that's right. being mean. Well, because but that... when you stand that, up for yourself and your party and what you believe in, that's not being mean. I have a, a different perspective being where I'm at and running for state rep here because I'm a tiny blue dot in a very fast sea of red. I had to talk almost exclusively to Republicans to even get a few extra votes. But I didn't talk to them and point out all of the flaws in their own party. I just talked about what I went through at the gas station, the grocery store, yeah. the doctor's office, the fight I just had with my insurance company. I just talked about everyday issues and asked for what did they see happening? And it would turn out we had the same idea. They completely supported the policies of Democrats. They just didn't know it was a policy of Democrats until you have that conversation and you get them down to that everyday level. You're not talking politics. You're talking daily life. You're talking about issues that hit you every day. How many times have you sat on the phone with your insurance company for hours trying to get them to understand your medication is life-saving to me? Well, when you say you can't stand in front of them and tell them the faults of their party, who the hell made all the problems? Well, at the same time, you're having... Where do you sacrifice... You are telling them the, the fallacy of their party. Without yeah, exa them exactly. And without telling them the wrong. It's their po it's those policies that put them exactly where they are. Yeah. I well, find no group more confounding to me than farmers in rural PA. It's not Democrats that put them where they are. It's not Democrats that allowed that allowed private fossil fuel companies to claim their land as if it were their own, destroying the ability to grow anything, poisoning the water, defunding, yes, he said, defunding the schools that their kids go to. We didn't do that. Nope. Maybe these people, and, and maybe these folks need a verbal 
need the verbal equivalent of a smack in the head to remember it. So when and do we do that? We're in different positions too. You as an activist can do that. Me as a candidate cannot. I can only talk about policies I would put forward. Is truth and not truth no matter who's listening to it? And when they realize we're on the same page and I'm not some hated image of a Democrat. I'm an actual real person that's doing the same exact thing that they go through every single day. And I'm rehumanizing the Democratic Party. And I'm spending the time with rural farmers, with rural residents, period, regardless of their job. And that's where we fail in the message. I, I can easily walk up and hit them over the head with a baseball bat. What kind of conversation is going to follow? It's going to be me and handcuffs with police officers. I can't hit people over the head with a baseball bat. Mm. I have to find other ways to talk. I think all of us as Democrats, progressives, need to find another way to, to have a conversation because we're not talking. You had said that earlier in the program. We're not even having the conversations anymore. And we need to. We need to get back to having conversations so that we start to rehumanize each other. And that's exactly why getting people inside the party is as desperately important needed. as it has ever been it is as desperately needed as ever and part of the reason i also ran is because i want my kids to see what a public servant is supposed to be that's what each of these elected officials is supposed to be a public servant we serve the public we serve at the public pleasure period if they have an issue it's not up to us Say something like, you know, Joe said, well, that's not something I'm personally passionate about. So it's not something I'm going to look into or sponsor or co-sponsor. And I am directly calling him out because I have documentation proving he said that exact thing to a number of groups that went to him with issues, including their district. He doesn't care if the maps are fair. It's not something he's personally passionate about. Well, it, benefit, it, it benefits him not. It, it probably it benefits, benefits him not to have a fair map. So he is not. He is not concerned with whether or not our voting maps are fair. He cares that they're rigged just enough that he gets to stay in power. Well, that's how they make money. That happens on both sides across the country. I can't say Democrats are blameless in it because they've done it. Too. Not as effectively, clearly. <laughs> right. But they have done it as well. And I want my kids to see a public servant. This is what you're supposed to do. I'm supposed to listen to you. I have, I have two boys. One is a Democrat. He's as Democrat as he's going to get. The other one, and I say this laughingly, I don't know where I went wrong because he's a Republican. <laughs> But he was a Republican that did not support Trump. But he does support the rest of the GOP. Well, they're one and the and same now. I would equally represent both of them. If one came in with, you know, one issue, it's something I'm going to look into and get back to them on. The other one comes in, I'm going to look into it and get back to them. And I'm going to do it fairly and honestly. It has nothing to do with my personal preference. It has to do with this is the concern of a constituent who elected me in office, or even if they voted against me, it's still a constituent and I still have to answer their concerns and I still have to work on their behalf as well. It was President Kennedy that said that politics can and should be a noble profession. Yes. And I believe that it still can be. And our uh, founding fathers wanted people in positions. This wasn't meant to be your only job. No. It wasn't meant to the be congressional like, uh, no. the congressional schedule was originally set around farming. Yes, it was summer, spring and summer. They met during the winter. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. it was an easier way to say it. They met during the winter and it was not meant to be a full time job. And there were actually arguments in the con in the Continental Congress, the Constitutional uh, Convention, sorry, um, about, you know, limiting uh, such things they chose not to do that and uh, you know that's a, probably a better discussion for a different day about term limits and so on but uh, uh, that was a discussion in the continental uh, in the constitutional convention but that's yeah I, I 
politics can and should be a noble profession. I believe it still can be. I believe there are folks that actually do make a noble profession out of it. There are Republicans that still make a respectful uh, job of it. Uh, you know, Larry Hogan, I don't agree with, you know, everything Larry Hogan stands for, the governor of Maryland, but I, I actually, but I believe in my heart, he's a good and decent man. He was begging for a chance to go put down that insurrection on January 6th. Uh, the Republican governor of, um, of Massachusetts, whose name is absolutely escaping me right at the moment. Uh, I believe he just announced he's not running for re-election uh, in an in a interesting maneuver. Actually, I'm actually not sure why he's not running for re-election. He probably could be re-elected. In blue, Massachusetts, um, you know, has been very vocal against the fascist turn in his party and has uh, and has a very, you know, very solid approval rating inside Massachusetts. Seems to be a good and decent man. Uh, I don't believe in nearly anything um, from a policy standpoint that Liz Cheney stands for. She voted with the Trump regime, I think it was 80, 97% of the time, more so than even McCarthy or Gates or any of them. And, but actually tends to, she's actually has the audacity to believe that democracy should survive, that her party should actually go out and make a case to win elections rather than rig them or steal them or, or draw maps around them. I don't agree with her on any policy position other than those if you consider that a policy position i actually consider it a a patriotic a decision position. yeah a human and patriotic decision but we're approaching the end of the program and i'm going to talk to you in about 10 minutes that's great in a different venue so i will talk to you then thank you for being a caller here please tell everyone you know see you called you survived and everyone that's listening please email or send a letter it's easy am party. i not right charlie baker george tells me is the governor of massachusetts thank you for saving my memory george has done Thanks. nothing but save my memory this entire program i got so flustered at the beginning of it my brain's just not working but yes listen so to amanda what, what why i was calling in was I, I anyone that's listening please contact your county chair contact your state committee person contact state committee executive level directly email letters phone call. Let them know that you don't approve of them endorsing candidates before the primary. Let the people's voices be heard. Don't put your fingers on the scale. Don't try and tip a selection in more favor to keep elitists in, to keep the status quo. We don't want the status quo. And all it does is further disenfranchise. It causes lower voter turnout because people start to feel like their voice doesn't matter anyway. No one's saying their candidate's not going to stand a chance. And I'm sure that there are a billion Bernie supporters who will say the exact same thing still from 2016 and right. again in 2020. Yep. So I will talk to you soon, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah, I'll talk to you in just a couple answering. minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Talk soon. Bye. Two old callers tonight, and no one uh, was harmed in the filming of this program. It is 7.57. We are approaching the end of the program rather rapidly. I want to thank very, very much. Thank uh, our guest, Rep. Rick Krajewski, a man of his word who came, um, you know, again, who's, you know, we had that scheduling mix up he said i promise i promise i will be there and he was and he was for oh gosh uh about an hour 40 something like that about an hour 40 hour 45 so that was brilliant uh two callers uh great discussion we appreciate it so much see folks i don't give the number just for entertainment i give it because it's open and because we want to hear from you, I am absolutely just gobsmacked at the, the lack of phone calls that we get on this program. I know April has tried to soothe my ego and tell me that it takes a while to build those phone calls, but um, it's not hard. It really, really, really isn't hard. I mean, you can call and it's just a conversation. And it's your phone call is really no different as far as how we approach it or how we talk to each other than the way I talk to the guests. You know that. <coughs> Whoa, excuse me. A little tickle 
there. Uh, maybe that's God trying to tell me to wrap it up. Uh, so I will wrap it up. I think that's a very good place to do so as we approach eight o'clock. Let me again walk you through. George has put on the screen um, for those of you watching and for those of you who are just on the radio, he has put up the number for the congressional switchboard. What is the congressional switchboard? It is the central number to call Congress, to call the Senate and call the House, Congress. Uh, we tend to use the word Congress to represent the House of Representatives. Congress actually means both chambers. Um, but that said, you can call this number, give the very nice people who answer the phone, you give them your zip code. If you do not know who your elected member of the House of Representatives is, if you do not know who your senators are, frankly, something you should know. If you don't, you call the central number, operator answers, they ask you for your zip code, and then they will put you through to the right people. The congressional switchboard is 202, area code 202. 224 3121. 202-224-3121. 202-224-3121. 202-224-3121. Call your representatives and speak to them. They take the calls, they record the calls. They may not, well, they may not record the actual, like, you know, the actual phone call itself, but the person, the, the staff are in those offices who takes constituent phone calls. They do take notes. What did you call about? Where did you call from? What's the issue that's important to you? You call there, keep your phone call very, very polite, very, very pleasant, because for the staffers, some of the staffers that are answering these phones are unpaid college interns. They're not paid staffers. And whatever troubles you might be having, they are not the reason. So be nice to the good folks answering the phone. Keep it to 30 seconds, 60 seconds max. And don't forget the power of voting, the, uh, of visiting the local offices for your local elected representatives. Uh, if your member of the House of Representatives has multiple local offices, find the one closest to you. Write a letter, write a good old fashioned letter and take it to those offices. It means a lot. And then representatives take notice, your senators and your elected members of the U.S. House, your state representatives. We had State Rep Rick on tonight. They, they know. They pay attention. Sit down at the computer and type out a letter, hand sign it, and deliver it. It is very powerful. It's still, even in this age of social media and videos and TikTok and all of these things, and Facebook and all the different ways that, that, that your reps communicate with you. Some, when you have a real problem and you need constituent services or you really want to make your voice heard, go to the office. It's still very powerful. Or call the congressional switchboard, 202-224-3121. We hope you had a great Thanksgiving. We hope you will have safe, healthy, smart, uh, Christmas and New Year holidays coming up. We're not done with you yet. We will return next week. It will be our final live program of 2021. It will be a roundtable discussion, relaxed, we hope, serious topics as always, but we hope a generally relaxed conversation uh, interaction even between the guests, your phone calls, your comments, your questions. And then we will be off for two weeks. We will be off Christmas week, we'll be off New Year's week, and we are currently uh, scheduled to return to you on January 9th. So we'll be live with you next week, two weeks off, back on January 9th. So don't go anywhere. You have one more program. And I really do need to put that poll up on the Facebook page to ask you all about the Wednesday night program. Uh, number of members at that other side of information on Facebook are now at, I'm scrambling to look. Oh goodness, I need to do this a little faster. Uh, 971, 971 members. 
of that other side of information. We really, really, really want to break a thousand by the end of the calendar year. So the 12th is pretty much done. Let's say the 13th to the 31st is 18 days, I think he said. It's 18 days to get to a thousand. If you are already a member of that other side of information, invite five people. I'm just asking you to go through your friends list and invite five people. If you want to invite 10 or 20 or 100, you're welcome to do it. But if every single one of you just invited five people, we would break a thousand. I need you. I'm asking you to please do that. And I'm also asking you to call your representatives. I'm asking you to tune in. Whether it's cable news, newspapers, radio, I happen to think you should tune into foreign sources, which is where we post most of our articles from. Not all, but most are from foreign sources. Um, they don't have the kind of slight on them or, 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 or look at them that you, uh, that concern so many people, the biases that concern so many people, whether those biases are real or not, um, foreign sources lack all of that. So stay tuned in. Please check on family and friends and neighbors. See what you can do for them. This virus is still a real thing. Cases are spiking all over the country, especially where the cold weather has already settled in. So check on your friends, check on your family, check on your neighbors on either side of you, across the street from you. If you're in an, a, a building above you and below you, check on them, see if they need anything. Let's rebuild our society and rebuild our communities. I believe that does it for us. We've probably done all the damage we can do for one night. We will return next week live with our roundtable discussion, 5 p.m. Eastern Sunday, December the 19th. I just did math in my head again, and it's getting slower, I noticed, the more that I do it. We wish George a very happy birthday yet again. George, sir. Oh, sorry about that. Hey, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> well, happy birthday again. Thank you. It was December 7th, but that's okay. Well, this was the closest. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. 12 yeah. months of it. Yeah, okay. uh, I guess I could have done it last week too, but. It's okay. I mean, it's good to be an adult, right? Now you can drink legally. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to get older. Do you have anything you want to leave the people with before we say goodbye? No, I do not. Um, Just be here next week? I will be here next week. Call? No, I mean the, the things that you desperately want oh. to impart to people? Yes. Uh, yeah. Call? Be here next week? I like um, also want to thank Randall for wishing me a happy birthday. Um, our one fan. <laughs> Sorry, I'm our one caller. I was gonna our say, one fan. Sorry, I don't think he's the only, <laughs> if he's the only fan, we'd have got kicked off a long time ago. Oh my goodness! I meant he, say our he one is our caller. steady caller, but that's true. If you if you only had one fan, man, wow, we've been going a long time ago. Uh, let me. Um, and Amanda, well, and also Amanda, Amanda, okay. wish me a happy birthday. So. Yeah, Randall, uh, Randall uh, uh, makes a good point really quickly before we say goodbye in the chat that um, he is a three-year-old grandson. Uh, oh, he's watch, he's babysitting his three-year-old <laughs> grandson this coming week because the teacher at his childcare tested positive for COVID. This thing is real, folks. It's real and it's still happening. Please, I beg you, get vaccinated. Nothing is going to happen to you. I am just as old and white and broken as I was before I got it. So please, nothing has changed. And by the way, if you're worried about a chip and somebody tracking you all over the planet, you're holding a tracking device. You're already being tracked all over the planet. It's called your mobile phone. All right. That said, I think that does it for us. That's all the damage we can do for one night. We will see you next week, December 19th, with our roundtable, 5 p.m. Eastern. For uh, Whitney, Marquise, Andrew, uh, Alexander, 
uh, Taekwon Sarge, everybody at TCP4, DJ Earl, DJ Lex, and our all of our Hot101.net family for associate technical producer Lynn Dare, who is desperately looking forward to our new Wednesday uh, program. She's really looking forward to it. Kristen doesn't think it's true, but she's really looking forward to it. I know George knows it's true, too. Lynn's very much looking forward to Wednesdays. Um, and for the birthday boy, our technical producer, George Dare, for the woman responsible for all of this, uh, who got this all going. And I very much hope that she will be here next week. I'd really like to have her here in the studio, uh, April Riddick. Uh, and for Kristen and for uh, the union rep, uh, Sis and the cats. Sis continues to do quite well. Thank you. Um, she's an amazing, she's an amazing soul. As soon as we figured out that she was diabetic and got uh, insulin into her, she's actually doing quite well. She's still skinny. Um, you know, we're trying to get some, some weight back onto her, but she's actually doing quite well. She is ornery and uh, has an awful, awful lot to say. Um, but she's also always cuddled up on my lap and I couldn't be happier about that. So I am Jeff Kennedy. I think I covered everybody. We very much thank you for being here. Remember that other side of information is there all week for you to see the articles that we post. If you missed any of tonight's program, you can go to youtube.com slash that other side of information and you can see the entire program and all of our programs. The program will also be available on Instagram, that other side of information on TikTok. Well, I'm on TikTok. Uh, Patreon, that other side of information and you can find me uh, we'll put it on, I will put a link to it on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at that Kennedy talk or search for that other side of information. And I will also put it on my LinkedIn at Jeff Kennedy. Plenty of places to find the program, never a shortage. We thank you so much for being here. Please take care of yourselves, stay healthy, get vaccinated and uh, take care of yourselves and each other. And until next week, we say good night for now. We will see you next week. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. Have a great week. Take care.